for coming on to Adobe Data World 2022, the biggest data online conference for marketing and technical communications professionals. It is really rare to see such a large gathering of content experts who excel at the science and art of communication. We all know uh, that effective communication can solve a lot of problems, not only in the context of business, but also in real life. Whether you're interacting with your family or business associates, or you're driving away any political or social awareness, effective communication can do wonders. I hope you will continue to excel at what you do, follow your dreams, chase your goals, take calculated risks as I have, and continue to make the world a better place in every possible way you can. So today I'm going to share with you some of the experiences along these lines. Winning is addictive. And to reach the top spot and keep staying at number one, you will need to give yourself big, audacious goals. I wanted to be a better tennis player every single time I stepped on the court. And in this pursuit, I never stopped learning. I pushed myself to learn, adopt new techniques to be the better version of myself. I was competitive even when people weren't looking at me. I was competitive with myself and I challenged myself during practice. For example, I would throw snowballs against the tree and see how many times in a row I could hit that tree. Uh, I was timing myself on, on a bicycle riding around our garden, see if I could go faster. Uh, I actually built a little ramp on, the, on, the, on, the, on one of the sharp corners so that I could go a little bit faster yet. Nobody was watching, but I loved it. I loved, um, I loved competing with myself. Of course, I have loved and I will continue to love tennis. Tennis has always been my passion. I started as a child and I continue to pursue my tennis dream through all the ups and downs. Of course, it was not always easy. And I would not necessarily recommend leaving a country to achieve what I did. It was... Um, to say that it was hard is an understatement. Uh, I was away from my family. Uh, as it turned out, I did not see my, my mom for four years. I didn't see my sister and my father for five years. It was a one-way ticket for me. I couldn't go back to Czechoslovakia, uh, the Czech Republic. They couldn't come to see me. Um, so that was a big step to take. So after that, playing tennis was uh, not exactly a lot of pressure. Uh, I also wasn't accepted by the crowd uh, so much. Um, initially, they were friendly, but once I started winning and being a lesbian, that was not a plus back in the 80s. So I had to learn to uh, just uh, fight the crowd and fight the opponent and still enjoy somehow playing, playing, on, on playing, playing the matches. Uh, at the end of my career, I couldn't put a foot wrong. Uh, everybody was clapping. They were just happy that I was actually uh, standing still. Standing up, uh, you know, in the old days, I had an amazing shot and it was like, oh, nice shot. And then at the end of my career, I, I had a normal shot. They're like, oh, my God, what a great shot she hit. But of course, by then I was 38 years old. So there is that. But uh, it's nice how times have changed. So I'm sure that leaders in the audience uh, would understand that to keep performing at the top level, you will need to take calculated risks like I did. Again, maybe you don't have to change countries, but still, you have to be willing to take risks, uh, as it was for me. I took a lot of risks in my life to pursue my dream. Uh, my attitude to risk is probably on the higher side than most, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I did not think I was taking risks at the time. Uh, but if you look back on it, maybe it's more apparent. Um, calculated risks, coming to the net. Um, I remember playing a match way back on grass against Gina Garrison in Eastbourne, and uh, I won 6-2, 6-3. And Gina was hitting amazing shots on, on the run, passing me left and right, uh, and I kept coming in. And uh, again, calculated risk. At the, at, after the match, the a reporter asked me, why did you keep coming to the net when she passed you so many times? I said, what was the score? 6-2, six, 6-3. Six, you remember the great shots, but you don't remember the ones that she missed or that I put away. So that's what kind of you call calculated risk. Uh, same when I go skiing. Um, I, I've gone heli skiing. I, I, I've gone 60 miles an hour plus on skis. But I, I've got there gradually. It's all calculated risk. When I do a jump uh, on skis, 
I first see where the landing is, and and then I go over, see where the landing is. The next time I go maybe a little bit faster of the same jump. The next time a little bit faster. So it's a risk if I don't know what's on the bottom, right, of the landing. But if I suss it out and I do it gradually, I I basically have never fallen down from jumping because I don't like to take risks. I take calculated risks. So I would encourage you to take risks uh, because that will help you, help you overcome challenges and reach your goal. Um, I've won a lot of tournaments, titles over the years, and it is a great honor to be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, the game of tennis has evolved so much over time. Wooden rackets were, were replaced by fiberglass. The open era was introduced in 1968. Um, so as tennis was going through innovation, I had to reinvent myself uh, because I wanted to keep performing at the same level or better level. So I changed rackets. From, I went from wood to metal. And even as those rackets were evolving, I kept trying to find one that's a little bit better. Uh, I changed my diet in pretty uh, serious way. It's not that I wanted to lose weight, but I wanted to be more fit for, for, for training as well as uh, playing the matches. I want to make sure that that's, that's one thing I, you can control, right? How, how fit you are for the matches. I didn't want to, there to be any excuses and, and have to adapt my game to, uh, uh, play differently because I was getting tired. So I, I've covered all those all those aspects of of of, of pre preparation. Um, what I ate, when I ate, how much I ate, how much I trained, uh, also uh, how much uh, how much uh, I worked on the particular uh, strategy for that match. Um, I changed my footwork uh, at, at the end of my career when I wanted to win Wimbledon one more time. By then the game evolved, and uh, in the old days you were uh, you were taught cross cross step. The first step was cross step, and then you got to the ball because you were hitting the ball with a close stance. Because of the new rackets, the uh, uh, the technique completely changed, and you were hitting balls with open stance, which meant outside foot first. So I literally had to learn how to the first step to get to the ball. I had to go instead of this way. I had to go this way. Left foot to the forehand, right foot to the backhand. And I started literally with Billie Jean just throwing the ball next to me. Then she would hit to me from like five feet away and then a little bit over the net. If you had seen me, uh, if you had seen me as a, as a spectator, you thought I was a total beginner learning how to get to the ball. I was 33 years old. I had one Wimbledon eight times, but I wanted to win it one more time. So I totally learned how to how to change my footwork. And after one year, it was completely natural. Now, if I had to go back to the other way, it would be really difficult. So again, uh, I, uh, to, to improve, I was, uh, I was adapting everything to become the best tennis player I could be. Uh, being a tennis champion has been my life, but that's of course not all. I dedicate a lot of my time to champion human rights. I tried my best to raise awareness on equal rights for women. Uh, whether it's in sports or any aspect of life, equal rights, of course, recognition of the LGBT communities around the world. So I hope to continue making an impact for the rest of my life. I'm not afraid to speak out, and I will always fight for what I believe in. Uh, I was recently asked what I would tell my 10-year-old self, uh, what would I do differently? And the answer to that is don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, my coach uh, also wasn't afraid to ask for help, but it's okay to not know everything. Um, it's okay to ask for help and then listen and hopefully implement that into whatever field you're in. Uh, as I might have gotten 10 pieces of advice from my coach, but I knew, okay, this one sounds good. I'll do that right away. This one, I'm going to work on that. And this one, I want to do that, but I'm not quite ready for it. And the other things, no, that's not me. That's, that's like asking me to wear a dress one. All I want to do is wear pants. So it's important to know what you really, uh, who you are, what you can and cannot do at that moment, and then take charge. So on that note, uh, I hope that you will continue to follow your passion and uh, be the best version of yourself, whether it's in your professional or professional or personal life. I hope that you stay well and stay safe. And uh, I welcome every single one of you to Adobe Detail World once again. And I wish that you have a great learning experience in the event. 
uh, I thank you for your time. And I hope that, um, you know, there was something that I said that maybe click with, with some of you in some way, some positive way. So another thing that I want to say is always surround yourself with people that are positive, that are helpful to you, whatever it is that you're doing. I've done that all my life. Um, and it is essential, whether it's, whether it's as an athlete or in business or in personal life, if things don't go your way, ask for help and surround yourself with people that are positive in your, in your, and, um, I've done that and it's, I've done pretty well on that front. So don't be afraid to ask for help and, and go for it. Most of all, go for it. Don't be afraid to go outside of your comfort zone a little bit. All right. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah O'Keefe and I'm here to talk to you about the future of publishing once again. And this time I want to talk to you about content as a service. So a couple of quick things here. What is content as a service? How can I use it? What are the challenges that we're facing? And what's this thing going to look like going forward? My name is Sarah O'Keefe. I'm the CEO of Scriptorium, which was founded 25 years ago in 1997. We address interesting technical challenges around product and technical content. How do we combine content and publishing to improve the business value of the content that we're delivering to our end customers, improve the customer experience and all that other good stuff. We do a ton of XML and Ditto work. We work with CCMSs, uh, especially including AEM guides. And I am delighted to be here with you today. My team is distributed and based largely out of North Carolina in the United States. So first off, what is content as a service, right? Uh, content as a service means that you are going to produce content on demand. So instead of packaging content up into a PDF or even a static HTML site, we're going to wait until the client comes along, the customer comes along and says, hey, I need something specific. And at that point, we are going to deliver it to them exactly what they asked for. Uh, content as a service means that we are going to need to store information in some sort of a format neutral approach. Uh, this is the Ditto world event. So for those of you that are familiar with Ditto, that is in fact an XML format neutral approach. With content as a service, we're typically talking about something that is compatible with API delivery of some sort. And we're going to defer the actual formatting, rendering it into HTML or PDF or whatever it may be that the end customer wants until much later in the process than we're actually accustomed to. And I do believe that what we're dealing here with here is the future of publishing. And I know, especially for those of you that have heard me speak before, you're sitting here thinking oh, again with the future of publishing. And my answer is in fact, I'm sorry, but yes. So let's talk a little bit about why I think that is the case. I want to start with traditional publishing, right? And traditional publishing looks something like this. You author the content, you go through some sort of a production process a, and also a distribution process. And then the end user gets your content in a nice shiny package, whether a book or a website or something, and then they consume it. Now, we can argue that things have changed, but I'm actually going to argue that things have actually not really changed that much. We now have digital workflows and we have online authoring and we have web publishing, but that ultimately that process of write it, sort of package it and consume it hasn't really changed in 500 years. So here we are. We write the content, we format it, we publish it, we distribute it, and then our end user consumes it. So another way of looking at this would be sort of what, what's the architecture, right? What does that network diagram look like? And so over here on the left, we have content creation where authors are going in and working on the content and putting it all together and doing what they need to do. You then render it into, again, PDF, HTML, or other formats, online help formats, and you stash those rendered formats 
in some sort of a repository, whether it's a, a website for delivery or it's just you know a SharePoint site with a bunch of PDFs on it or whatever. And then eventually your customer comes along and they say, hey, I need that piece of information and they go get it from your repository. So they make that request and they get the information they need. Now, in content as a service, this process looks similar, but not, to, not the same. We still have content creation, and I think that won't change a whole lot, especially for those of you that are already doing structured content. The things that you have to do to support structured content will go a long ways towards enabling content as a service, and I'll talk a little bit about why that is later on. So you create your content, you park it in a repository, but then the requester comes along and the requester says, hey, I need this kind of information and I want you to give it to me in this format. And at that point, when they request the content, you do the rendering and the packaging. So what's happening here is that that rendering, packaging, formatting process is being shifted over much, much later in the process to the requestor. So instead of having a, you know, a couple of one-way arrows and kind of a one-way process where we as authors and publishers get to write the content and then package it and control what it looks like and then deliver it, we have a case where the end user is the one that chooses what information they want, what format they want it in, and we, you know, sort of they go, come to us and say, hey, give me that stuff. And then it is our job to deliver to them the information that they are asking for. So this represents a pretty fundamental shift in how we create content or the entire content life cycle, but also in how we're gonna to have to manage this because take a look at this. Over on the traditional publishing side, we have the process to write, format, publish, distribute, and consume pretty much in order. On the content as a service side, um, we write, we create, but then things get immediately kind of weird because you'll notice formatting is much later in the process. And publishing, we publish, but we're not publishing in the sense of put it all together and make it look nice in a book, but rather we're publishing these disparate, disjointed perhaps, modular pieces of information that then the customer, the consumer can choose to put together however they want. So if you look at this as an ownership issue, right? Uh, we have owners, and in traditional publishing, the content creators, that's probably you and me, get a lot of control over what happens, and then the consumer at the very end gets to consume the book or the online help system or the website that we have made available to them. In content as a service, that transition from owner to consumer in terms of control happens much, much earlier. So there's an interesting shift happening here. Now, why, why do we want to do such a thing, right? We have to ask the question of what will this buy us? And there's some really interesting stuff that this can potentially buy us. For starters, this may actually allow us to address the problem of silos. And I'll talk a little bit about that next. Uh, also, content integration from disparate sources. Um, again, content duplication is something that we want to avoid, and this will help us with that. And then personalization and lightweight delivery are the other two things that I'm looking at as potential CAS um, features or things we can do with CAS. All right, so most of you know about the silo problem, right? You have a repository such as a content management system and you have a learning management system and you have a knowledge base and you have a, a support ticketing system and you have all sorts of things. And every one of them has its own publishing workflow and its own set of deliverables. And if I'm now playing the role of the consumer, when I go in and I try to get information out of these systems, it can be extremely frustrating because I kind of have to know where to go and maybe the experience that I get from system A to system B to system B isn't consistent. We've been talking about silo busting and let's put everybody in the same authoring system so that they can just author everything together and then we can have a unified deliverable. Well, that sounds fantastic, but it hasn't worked. We've had a little bit of success in putting the tech comm people and the learning people together, but we haven't had a lot of luck with knowledge bases product information management, PIM systems, and some of these other things that are out there. So 
we've tried to get rid of the silos. We're not having much luck. And there's a reason for that. The component content management system, a CCMS like AEM Guides, is built to support authors who are creating technical and product content. A learning management system is built to support instructional designers and learning content developers. Those two things from the outside to the non-content person, they look really, really similar, but they do different kinds of things. And so an LMS is not a CMS, is not a KB. So we really have this issue that each system serves kind of a different purpose and is designed a little bit differently. So each silo then, each system has its own delivery pipeline and it's really, really hard to bring those into alignment, to have a unified look and feel and unified search across these three buckets of deliverables that we're looking at here. And, and that's the easy problem because that's a technical problem and solving technical problems is, is hard, but not impossible. The secondary problem, the much more difficult problem we have is that people like their silos or more accurately, they like their purpose built authoring systems for the role that they play and the requirements that they have. And so actually unifying at the creator level is very, very, very difficult. So the result typically is that you're going to have ununified customer experience on the front end, on the uh, consumer end, right? The consumers are going to be looking at these different slices of information that came out of different systems and actually unifying them into something coherent can be very, very challenging. So along comes content as a service. And what we're suggesting here, so the core of content as a service is essentially that your content is API enabled. You have the ability to use some sort of an API connector to reach in and grab content from a variety of sources. And what that means for you is that you can keep your authoring silos, but unify them upon delivery. So when I, as a consumer of content, go and ask for information, the content as a service, the CAS system can combine all these things and present me with a unified uh, deliverable or a unified uh, content presentation, even if it wasn't there on the back end. So what we're talking about here is the potential to combine the technical content management system, the regular content management system, the website, the product information management or the product lifecycle management, PIM and PLM systems, your enterprise resource planning, ERP systems like SAP, your knowledge base, your CRM, your service management systems. I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. So you have all this potential and you can perhaps do this without having to unify your authoring silos on the back end. As an outgrowth of this, perhaps, we can look at avoiding content duplication, which you know we've been working on for a long time. We've done a pretty good job of this, again, within our silos. Uh, we do a pretty good job using technologies like DITA to leverage reuse and do programmatic reuse so that we can write a topic or a piece of information one time and then use it in lots of places. With content as a service, you can take a look at instead of copying from silo to silo to silo and then having maintenance issues, you can just combine the content at the point of delivery and um, have it there. So let's take a look at this. Your silo based solution um, or sorry, your your traditional solution to what we're going to do with silos would be to reduce the number of authoring systems, cross connect the silos and then use potentially use federated search on the front end, on the consumer end, to reduce uh, the delivery systems or at least mitigate the delivery systems. In content as a service, what we're gonna say is, you know what, we're not gonna really touch the authoring silos. We've tried that, it's hard. People like their specific purpose-built tools. So instead, we're gonna make the content available via an API and then combine it as requested. So I see a lot of potential here to address some of the silo issues by doing this combination later rather than sooner. On the personalization side, when we take a look at what content as a service can potentially do for us, um, we have the potential to combine the personalization that we need with some of the features that CAS offers. 
So first, we're going to have to think about the content itself and enriching it with the right metadata that will support personalization. This is not new, and it is also not specific to CAS. We've been doing this for a while. So if you want to be able to segment based on audience as, um, you know, expert audience or user versus admin or something like that, then inside your content, you have to have metadata that supports that, that says this content is, is beginner stuff, this content is admin stuff, that type of thing. Or perhaps you have internal versus external, or you have particular chunks of information that are restricted in some way. It only goes to one customer, or you can only send it to a certain region, or you're required to send it to a certain region, and if you don't, very bad things will happen, but the content is not relevant to the other regions. So you personalize your content with metadata. You go through there and make sure that it has all the right tags, attributes, metadata associated with it, and then you sort of post that content up into some sort of a CAS repository, at which point it will be made available via the CAS API again. Now, the customer or the consumer is going to come into your uh, system or into your website probably, and they are either going to tell you things about themselves. You're gonna ask them, do you want beginner information or advanced? Are you experienced with these kinds of things? You know, what, what, what's your previous knowledge? Or perhaps they have a login because they are a customer of yours and this is, you know, um, internal information that you share only with customers, in which case when they log in and they set up their user profile, you may know exactly what products they have purchased, what software they have licensed, what services they have access to, so you can make sure that you deliver to them the right information based on their profile. Uh, you might look at their preferred language that they've indicated and make sure that you always deliver information in that language to them. So the functional difference here is we've been able to do this previously. You can put up a site that has 10 languages on it. And then you can kind of, you do, can do some browser sniffing and this, that, and the other thing, and you can make sure that people are directed to the right place. But the difference here is that instead of putting that content up ahead of time, so putting up 10 languages and putting up a couple of different variants and having all that HTML potentially, available ahead of time, what you're doing instead is when the customer comes to the site, you are then figuring out what information to give them at that point of request. You're not packaging it ahead of time into predetermined variants, which are then just on your site. Now, I know this sounds a lot like dynamic publishing, and in some ways it is. I think the biggest difference here is our focus on the idea of an API and of rendering th things through the API as opposed to whatever, you know, a dynamic publishing typically looks more like a sort of a Mad Libs approach. You know, you've got these holes and you can put things in the different holes. So now we have omnichannel delivery. Um, this is something where CAS has the potential to really help us. We have, I've talked a lot about PDF and HTML, but we have, we need to deliver content in JSON. We need to deliver uh, UI strings in a format that's compatible with the software that's being developed so that they can be dropped in there and appropriately translated localized. We have things like content on a watch or a phone or a kiosk or all these different aspect ratios, all these different formats that are supported. And we just don't know what's going to be coming along next in terms of formatting. Um, just in the last couple of years, we have things like chatbots and we have service management systems which need content and we have on device content and we just have all sorts of things, right? So if your channel, whatever it may be, supports a content API, it can then reach in and use the CAS content, which means that you can essentially just deliver it in a minimally formatted fashion and then allow processing to take place downstream that will optimize it for whatever that channel is. It means you don't have to lock in early to a particular delivery system or technology, and it means you have more flexibility down the road. Related to this, but separate, is the concept of a very lightweight delivery. And here I want to talk a little bit about the example of um, troubleshooting on a device. 
So let's say that you have some sort of a machine on a factory floor and it has an error code, right? It throws an error and says, hey, there's, there's a problem. Now, what happens at that point um, is in the past is that we would try and maybe put all the content on the device or perhaps the service tech is running around the factory with a tablet and they can take that error code, plug it into their tablet and figure out what's going on. But with CAS, we can look at it this way. The factory floor, the machine on the factory floor has an error code. It goes off to the service management system and the service management system says, oh, well, tell me more. Um, tell me about the voltage over here. And it can go through some troubleshooting steps and there are potentially, there's some logic and some, maybe even some AI there. You know, every time we see that error in our factory, it usually means this thing. It goes through all of that and eventually it returns, oh, okay, you have error 4566. That is a, a battery problem. You just need to replace the battery. Here are the instructions on how to replace the battery. The, the reason I refer to this as lightweight delivery is that what we can do is we can nearly eliminate the on-device storage requirement. Um, in the past, we've, when we've tried to do this, we have put content on the machine or on the device, and we rapidly run into problems that they tend to be storage limited, and we need to deliver not just the content, but in fact, the content in multiple languages, because we don't know what language the operator of the machine is going to be using. Even if we know that the machine is being shipped, let's say to Germany, we can't assume that the operator will want the content in German. The operator may be from another country, but working in Germany and they want it in their preferred local language or their preferred first language, right? And we wanna provide that to them because the better the operator understands the instructions, the safer it is for them to operate the machine. So we can't really make assumptions that, oh, if it goes to Germany, it just needs German. Or, oh, we'll just put English on it because everybody speaks English. That would be not so good. So, but we have these huge problems if we do ship content on device because we have to get it all on there. We have to think about localization. We run out of space and it's really hard to update, right? We have to get the content updates onto the device. So instead, what we can do, and I'll pause here and say, and this requires an internet connection to the machine, right? Which can be a huge obstacle. So if you belong to the people, the bucket of people whose industries don't allow for that, uh, you have air gap systems that you're not allowed to connect to the internet or to really anything else, or perhaps you have mining equipment that's um, many miles underground and there's no Wi-Fi underground, that kind of thing. I'm sorry, and we'll just we'll just set you aside for the moment. For the rest of you who have a factory with internet connectivity for the machines, which is of course more and more common these days, we can now look at eliminating or greatly reducing the on-device storage, right? Because instead of storing on the device, we're just gonna store that, hey, I have this error code, help me. And then the results might be displayed on device, but that's that's a very different can of worms, right? Because now we're only talking about a topic or two, not the entire corpus of all the information or all the error codes that you might need help for. It is also easier to update the centralized repository, again, with the prerequisite of connectivity. It is easier to update the centralized repository than it's going to be to update every single device that's out there. And then the device or the machine will make some sort of a lightweight call to the repo. So traditional diagnostic systems, it's all on the machine. We have storage capacity issues, complex updates, and languages. We've mitigated some of this with the concept of, you know, a service technician and a tablet in the factory, as opposed to putting it all on the machine. But in any event, we still have this big bucket of content that we need to deliver to somewhere. And with CAS, with content as a service, we are going to keep all the content in the CAS API and then just uh, push down the relevant content as it is requested. Similarly, with chatbots, we can do some stuff with CAS. Here, what we're going to do is we're basically going to separate the chatbot engine, the logic and the intent, from the content. We're just going to um, deliver the content into the chatbot, but we're not going to copy it in. We're just going to have links. So separate logic and content, 
let the engine request content from the repository and deliver the content one small chunk at a time. So in a, I hesitate to say traditional chatbot, but in a traditional chatbot, what you're going to have is a dedicated system for managing all this content and the content will be stored in the chatbot engine itself. Whereas in CAS, we're going to separate it out and say, nope, we're going to put the content in its own place and then just retrieve content from the CAS system or the CAS repository. So why is this important? You know, looking at this as a systems person and as somebody that builds systems and configures things and tries to move um, content authoring and content development workflows forward, why does this matter? Well, the big things are that we are going to be able to defer processing, provide for lightweight delivery and consumer choice in terms of what kind of content they get and potentially combine data sources or content sources without doing unified authoring. So these are kind of, these are the big things that I see that give CAS such potential and I think make it so important. When you publish, what you're essentially doing is packaging up your information and uh, predetermining the, the, end, the final result that your customer is going to get. So it's a little like baking. You put it all together and you cover it with this wonderful chocolate sauce and uh, you put it all together and there you are. And as a consumer, you get to pick, but you kind of have a menu to pick from. You have a limited set of choices to pick from. With CAS and content on demand, what we're looking at is that the publisher doesn't necessarily control those endpoints, and instead the consumer gets to control them. The publisher makes the content available and the consumer chooses what they want. Now, it's worth pointing out here that you could, of course, uh, create an endpoint and you could be the person creating that delivery endpoint. So you're not necessarily ceding 100% of your control to your customer, um, but this idea that we're going to put the content in an API and then there's all sorts of interesting downstream processing that could happen to it after we let it go is a little troubling, actually. Interesting, but a little troubling. So what do you need? Um, if you're going to have CAS, what are your content requirements? Well, these look an awful lot like structured content, right? You want modular content, you need individual steps that you can reach in and grab, you need individual error messages with their troubleshooting, you need metadata, you need to be able to address a particular piece of content, you need labels, you need categories, you need formatting hooks, but not formatting, and you really cannot operate in large, you know, chapter size blobs of content that is not going to work. So this looks to me an awful lot like the requirements that we identify for DITA and for modular structured content. So if you have that already, you're probably ahead of the game here. CAS is going to give you potentially um, a way for your consumers to control what they're requesting, a way to integrate content with data sources, and a way to separate out your content from the non-content repositories. Now, there are some challenges I should probably point out. Um, this further separation of content and formatting is going to be painful for those of us who care about content and formatting. There's going to be a lot of configuration effort, and there's going to be a requirement to align across your functional groups and get people talking to each other. That's going to be a huge issue. And for this last one, how granular, you know, how small is too small? How small can your content get before it becomes just unmaintainable and uncontrollable? I'd also like to point out that it's not going to be cheap. Um, the commercial tools have the great advantage that they are commercial tools and somebody's thought about, oh, you're going to need formatting like this, or, oh, you're going to need these kinds of things. CAS is wide open and has a ton of flexibility, but that comes with configuration effort and cost. And then sitting in the middle here, I have frameworks, which would be typically something like DITA, DITA Open Toolkit, DITA Based Publishing, where there's a framework in place, but you still have to do quite a lot of work. So this is a choice that you're going to make, which one of these you need or want, and the answer will be different for different people amongst you. So I believe, based on all of this, that CAS is probably going to be the future of publishing, 
And I guess the better question is, are you ready for this? Is your content ready? Do you have a strategy to move through this and figure out what you're going to do? So I'll leave you with that question. And thank you very much for coming today. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. everyone and welcome to my session from the ground up solving content redesign challenges with the AEM guides CMS. My name is Marco Kechikaro and I am a docs manager and senior tech writer at Blackberry based in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. Just mentioning the word Blackberry brings up some immediate thoughts and questions so I'll try to answer those right off the bat. Yes, Blackberry is still around and no, we are no longer in the business of phones. My team, Enterprise Docs, has always created customer documentation for the enterprise-grade software that BlackBerry offers to increase productivity and protect corporate data and users. If you'll indulge me for just a moment, I'd like to show a very quick video to give you an idea of what BlackBerry is all about these days. Since day one, we've been determined to change the world. Our devices placed the office in the palm of your hand and changed how we work forever. Our vision has expanded. Now we're pairing artificial intelligence with our trusted security and putting it everywhere. For too long, security was about what you stopped, but the internet of things is making everything smarter, including cyber threats. We've never been more connected or more vulnerable as ransomware and cybercrime explode, security needs to do more. It needs to stay ahead of threats. It needs to keep you safe. It needs to be intelligent. Prevention is the best medicine. This is especially true for IT systems. Much like vaccines prevent infection, our intelligent security is a prevention-first approach that stops cyber attacks before they can launch. If there is a breach, we have remediation solutions and services ready and in place. We help our customers solve their most critical security challenges. We protect more than 500 million endpoints, including over 195 million cars. We have design wins with 23 of the top 25 electric vehicle OEMs, ensuring vehicle safety and security. 45 of Fortune 100 companies trust us with their security. Our security is NIAP certified as classified. It is the highest security level awarded for government and industry. While cybersecurity lets you stop threats, intelligent security gives you the freedom to reach higher, go further, and dream bigger. BlackBerry Intelligent Security lets you change the world again. So as you can tell from the video, it's a very exciting time for BlackBerry because in the last few years, we have introduced new products in the zero trust market space that use AI and machine learning to detect and respond to cyber threats in real time. These new products are directly related to several content challenges that will be the focus of my presentation today. To, to give some very brief background, in 2019, BlackBerry acquired Silence, a respected software security company. This brought two important products into the BlackBerry fold, Protect Desktop and Optics. These desktop apps keep devices secure by proactively identifying and eliminating malware and other threats. Our customers as IT admins manage these products using a single web-based console. Throughout late 2020 into 2021, BlackBerry released new products managed through the same console to extend that type of zero trust protection to mobile devices, network connections, and user authentication methods. These products are Protect Mobile, Gateway, and Persona Desktop. Each of these products had its own doc set produced by Silence writers that we inherited or by members of our core BlackBerry Docs team. As a result, each doc set had its own structure and style. In early 2021, there was a real push in the company to stop discussing these offerings as different products, but rather to treat them as features of a larger solution that meets all security needs. 
this overall solution would be known as BlackBerry UES, the UES standing for Unified Endpoint Security. For us in Docs, this presented an exciting challenge. We had to take five separate doc sets and redesign them from the ground up to create a unified doc set that would meet the needs of all UES customers. We were up to the challenge because we understood the value of this idea. It would provide a one-stop shop for all help info. It would simplify the setup process for new customers, and it would allow us to do a better job of addressing the connection points and relationships between the products. My session today will focus on five specific content challenges that my team faced and how we use the features of DITA, the Adobe Experience Manager platform, and the AEM Guides CMS, formerly known as XML Documentation for AEM, and I'm very happy about the rebrand, uh, to solve those challenges. Challenge number one, getting on the same page. The Protect Desktop and Optics docs that we inherited from Silence were migrated into our AEM CMS from Madcap Flare. That took care of converting the content into DITA, but the style and structure of the content was dramatically different from the standards that our BlackBerry writers had been using for years. The docs for Protect Mobile, Gateway, and Persona Desktop were closer together in style as they were created by longtime members of our team, but they still had some differences based on the decisions made by those writers. We were faced with the challenge of resolving these differences and revising existing content to create new docs with a consistent structure and voice. Conrefs were a valuable tool that we leveraged. We've used Conrefs for many years for product names as they offer an efficient way to manage branding changes. We aligned with the latest UES branding decisions, finalized the Conrefs to use throughout our content for first instance and subsequent instances. So for example, in the first instance, we use the full Conref BlackBerry Gateway, and then for subsequent instances, we have an abbreviated CONREF, just Gateway. And we completed a thorough QA review of all of our data topics to ensure that CONREFs were used consistently. In the topics that were migrated over from MADCAP, we updated CONREFs where necessary to reflect the latest branding decisions and effectively bring those docs and topics up to date. To achieve consistency across the new UES docs, we worked together to define new data templates for specific types of content. The use of these templates enforced a common voice and style across the UES topics. For example, the standalone docs for each product had always included conceptual information to explain what the product is and what it does, but the presentation of that content varied from guide to guide. For the unified docs, we used a specific flow of topics to convey conceptual information in an effective, consistent way. And this involved the use of a series of templates across all of the different products that we discuss to make sure the information is always presented in an effective, consistent way. So what I've opened here is the overview doc from the UES Unified Doc Set, and I've zeroed in on a specific section for the product BlackBerry Optics. So as you can tell, it opens up with what we call a what is concept that explains what the product does and the value that it offers. It is then followed by a key features reference topic that details the, the product's value propositions in a, in a neat table format. This is then followed by an architecture topic um, that uses a image paired with a table and descriptions within the table um, to clarify the cloud and local components of the product. And where applicable, certain sections also include a data flow reference or multiple data flow references that explain how UES sends and receives data through the cloud server and local components and uses uh, kind of a numbered structure paired with an ordered list to clarify the movement of data through the solution. The release notes for each product offered a similar challenge as the content and organization varied greatly. We came up with a new template and structure that presented the release notes info for each product within the same document. So once again, I'll show that on our live site, the end product of our work and the templates that we established. Uh, so it's a single unified release notes document with a dedicated section for each product in the larger UES suite. And we're zeroed in here on the Protect Mobile section. And each section opens up with what we call uh, a what's new topic. 
which is a concept that lists uh, the new features and when they were released with the descriptions including a link to our other UES guides for more detailed information. This is then followed by reference topics that detail fixed and known issues using a standardized table format. This overall structure offers a clean reference document that anyone can consult for the latest info across the UES solution. My last example demonstrates how the Unified Docs gave us new opportunities to address the commonalities of the UES products. The old standalone docs were scoped to that product only, even though multiple products could be managed via the same screen in the UI. We created new templates for management tasks that clarified all of the actions you could perform on a specific screen across different products. And I will actually show you an example of that, not just on our, um, not on our public website, but actually within the authoring tool itself. Let me just flip here into edit mode and turn on the tags on view to give a better appreciation of the elements that we used. So this is a new task template that we developed for specific types of tasks that zero in on a specific portion of the UI, in this case, the menu assets devices, and using a task table format, it breaks down all of the tasks you can perform, not just for one specific product, but for two related products, uh, where there's one screen where you can do many different things, some of them impacting only one product, some of them impacting both products. So tasks like this and the use of templates like this help to get across the idea that we are offering a full comprehensive solution with related products and features. Another key action our team took in getting everything on the same page was to identify differences in how we were presenting the same types of content and making specific style decisions for how to use data elements. These discussions resulted in new standards that directly influenced our use of data. Some examples. We noticed that inherited silence content had a tendency to overuse note elements. We pared down the use of notes to enforce the idea that this element should only be used to highlight crucial information. Some of the inherited content featured a mixture of concept task and reference information within the same topic, largely because it was not originally authored in DITA, but converted to it as part of the migration effort. We revised the content where necessary to make sure each topic was clearly presented as a concept, task, or reference. Tables were formatted and presented differently across the standalone docs. In revising everything for the unified docs, we standardized the specific elements and configuration to use for tables. Some legacy docs also had a tendency to over-document, including lengthy references that itemized information that was already listed in the product UI. We eliminated this type of content to make the docs as streamlined as possible. Internal and external links were presented in different ways in the standalone docs. We enforced standard verbiage for different types of XREF elements to make it clear to customers whether they were jumping to a different section of the same doc or to an external doc or web page. So as you can see from these various examples, we made practical use of CONREFs, new data templates, and targeted adjustments to the use of data elements to bring a new level of order and consistency to the unified content. Challenge number two, keeping up with the pace. This challenge is directly related to how each of the UES products is developed and managed. The customer sees a single browser-based console with various screens to manage different features, but behind the scenes, each product is developed, tested, and released by a different team, with regular releases occurring on different schedules. These releases typically involve cloud pushes to the management console, as well as new versions of desktop or mobile apps. This was easy to manage with standalone docs because you didn't have to worry about any other products. You could just update your docs and release whenever your product released. The frequency of the required doc updates presented a significant challenge. <clears throat> Across all of the different products, the unified doc set would see content updates of different sizes on regular intervals, almost on a bi-weekly basis. Certain weeks could also see multiple updates depending on release schedules. Coordinating those updates while ensuring the integrity of the shared docs, allowing for ongoing work and keeping the content stable and reliable would be no small feat. 
Thankfully, the AEM CMS offers a versioning model that perfectly meets the demands of rapid release cycles and regular targeted updates. The AEM Guides version model is based on the idea of granular control and customization. We save a revision of our topics and or maps when the content for a new release is ready to go public, and then we manage those changes using the baseline model. So what I'm actually going to show you in our system is the baseline or multiple baselines for one of our unified docs or one of the docs in the unified doc set, our administration guide. So you can see here the output. These are our final output formats, the layout of all of the topics in the guide and the multiple baselines that we have on the map. This baseline design is perfect for a project like the unified doc set. Starting with our first release of the Unified Docs back in November 2021, we created an initial baseline for each map, which is a record of the version of each topic to use in your output. And we generated, we generated release content using those baselines. So you can see here the, the latest baseline of April 25th is the baseline that we've been using for our most recent output, our HTML and PDF output here. And for each subsequent release of the guide or each guide, we simply copy the previous baseline and then modify it to pick up new versions of topics as necessary. If topics have been added or removed or other map changes have occurred, we modify the baseline to pick up the new version of the map with those changes. So for example here, if I want to create a new baseline because I have a new update ready to go, I would select the most recent baseline of April 25th with, with all of its specific settings for the version of every topic to use. I would duplicate it, I would rename it. Let's say for example, if I renamed it to May 10th and I would give it a descriptive name to describe the release, let's say for example here, MTD 4.0 for example. I could then go through the baseline and then using the previous release that I copied from as a starting point, go through and set the versions of every topic to use as necessary. And obviously this column makes it much easier to tell for the version of every topic, whether it's the latest or whether it's an older version. And I can intentionally set the versions of everything to include in the output. Now there are several benefits to using this copy and modify approach to baselines. Since you are copying from the previous baseline, not creating a fresh one, there's no risk of picking up a new version of a topic unintentionally. The UI makes it very clear which topics are set to the latest version and which are using an older version. So you have granular control over the content that you want to use in your PDF and HTML output. Writers can continue to work on and revise topics for future releases without their work or revisions putting the baselines at risk. Writers don't have to hold off on making changes to topics as the baseline is a reliable gatekeeper. Baselines are also very useful for tracking and records. We name baselines with a date and a short description of the release. So just by looking at the available baselines, you can tell how often the doc has been updated and when it was generated and posted. Using baselines also offers very clear benefits for translation, which leads to our next challenge. Challenge number three, optimize how we localize. Our initiative to create a unified doc set also coincided with the dev team's goal to translate the web console that UES customers use into multiple languages. This meant that we would also have to translate our UES content for the first time. Now, our team has been localizing docs for a very long time, but the UES product presented some unique challenges due to the frequent nature of the updates and the fact that so many products and features would constantly drive changes to the common doc set. Most products that we localized previously saw release cycles that were a few months apart, making it fairly easy to plan localization work. With UES seeing updates at least a few times per month, we had to develop a strategy that would allow us to deliver high quality translated docs without disrupt disrupting ongoing work for the releases that were always in progress. Thankfully, the same baseline model that we leveraged to manage constant release cycles would also give us the means to localize our content in a practical way. The AEM CMS offers a baseline translation feature that allows you to select a map baseline and send the specific content set in that baseline for translation. We made the decision to kick off a localization cycle at a set time every two months, 
and we would use the most recent baseline available on the map at that time. Leveraging baseline translation on a set schedule would allow us to hit some key goals. We could kick off a translation run without disrupting work for upcoming releases. We didn't, we didn't have to enforce content freezes or tell our writers to hold off on work as the baseline would always be a reliable record that we could use for the translation export. In using a regular bi-monthly schedule, <clears throat> we hit a fine balance between keeping the localized docs up to date and constantly kicking off localization projects. A two month cycle also gave us the time we needed to complete proper QA reviews on localized content. For example, completing the work for localized images that we got back, conducting proofs, correcting links to make sure they hit the right destinations and so on. In shaping the unified doc set, we also made some very conscious choices about our content to make it translation friendly. Our technical editor set specific standards for terminology, uh, various types of terminology and various types of descriptions uh, that would make the content easier to translate across languages. So one of the many examples is the use of the word cyber threat. So he specifically set out the standard to use it as two separate words with a space in between versus an abbreviated form or a combined form uh, because the use that he suggested is easier to translate into different languages. We avoided the inclusion of screenshots unless absolutely necessary to convey information beyond what was already contained in the text, as screenshots tend to introduce additional translation cost and maintenance issues, especially when you, when you consider that the console would see many advancements and changes over the next calendar year. Our use of CONREFs also proved valuable for localization purposes, as we could give the vendor specific direction to not translate CONREF objects that we used for product names. The benefits of baseline translation and the conscious choices we made in constructing our data content allowed us to develop an effective, efficient localization plan. Challenge number four, ease the transition. The biggest challenge we faced didn't have much to do with the content itself, but with how external customers and internal teams, including support, sales, and customer engagement, were used to consuming it. The silence content that we inherited was previously distributed via PDFs in a separate admin portal in combination with a series of KB articles. When we moved that content onto our docs.blackberry.com site, it was a significant shift for internal teams and customers to get used to. On top of that, all of these groups were accustomed to the individual docs for each product. On the previous business model, BlackBerry and Silence were operating under, people were generally only concerned with one product at a time and were only interested in the content for that one product. The push for a unified product and a new all-encompassing security solution was very new, and our team was one of the first in the company to really adopt that mindset and shape our content with that focus. To make UES successful, we couldn't continue using that same siloed approach to content, even though certain groups still wanted that. We had to think about the bigger picture about how to get all of these groups thinking about UES as a holistic solution with ties and relationships between all of the different products and features that it includes. This, of course, is easier said than done. People generally aren't big fans of change, especially when it comes to product docs, as they just want material that they are familiar with and that they know how to navigate. To this end, we explored one of the key advantages and selling points of the AEM CMS, to help bridge that transition from standalone to unified docs. One of the main reasons we made the move to the AEM CMS over three years ago was because it was offered as a plugin to a complete web platform, Adobe Experience Manager. In creating and launching our new site three years ago, we took full advantage of this benefit and constructed a site that combined generated data content for our docs with AEM web pages built using intuitive, user-friendly web templates. We use these templates and the various AEM components that they offer to build attractive and easy to navigate landing pages, product pages, and other supporting resources that guide customers to generated data content. And I can show you kind of the end product of using those templates right now. Um, so this is the landing page of our site, docs.blackberry.com 
which we've created and maintain now using these intuitive AEM web templates. So as you can see here, we use an approach where everything is designed at the first level by selecting a block based on your product, right? So once you select the product that you are interested in, you simply click it, and that leads you to the, what we call a product page for that product, which is effectively a landing page for that product where you start to engage with the docs and resources available for that product. And again, it uses that kind of block design where you can choose the document that you are interested in. Once you do that, you are now in the generated data content that we've produced from that map that I showed you earlier. So we decided to use these intuitive web templates to create new resources and pages that would help all of our audiences adapt to the unified docs. In constructing the product page for our new unified docs, we experimented with the use of an easy to understand introductory image as the first thing and the major thing that you engage with when you get to the product page. And we designed this image to use icons and brief descriptive text to answer a number of questions about the product right off the bat, including who uses it, administrators and users, what it includes, iconography for all of the various products that it includes, what those products do, these short descriptions that clarify the actual function and value of the product, whether it be detection or resp and response, continuous authentication, network access and protection, etc. Uh, where they operate in the corporate infrastructure, whether it's at the browser level for admins or the cloud or network level or the mobile device and desktop level. And through the entire thing and the combination of these images and text and the overall layout, why all of these different pieces are valuable and useful. By using this image as the first touch point on the page and designing the page in this way, via the, the kind of freedom of these AEM web templates and web design options, we are telling the story of UES to brand new customers and also revealing to longtime customers the other parts of the UES package that are now available to them. Second, we wanted to provide a resource that offered a more direct correlation between the old docs and the new. We didn't completely reinvent the wheel in creating the content for the unified docs. We simply revised, reorganized, and refined to create docs that were more relevant and complete. The content that teams and customers wanted and were used to was still there, just available in a new and better form. To this end, we created what we call a navigation page that offers a mapping of the old docs to new. In a clean table format, it laid out where to find the relevant information for each product in a structure that mirrors the old standalone docs. So for example, uh, if you're a member of support or even a customer who's only concerned with the information about the BlackBerry Optics product, we've laid it all out here such that you can jump to the different sections of the unified doc set that uh, are relevant to optics. So for example, you can jump to the conceptual content about optics, you can jump to the section about setting it up in the setup guide, and so on and so forth. And this navigation resource also gives us an avenue to provide guidance and to lead these customers in these different groups to the new unified resources, including overview information, release notes, requirements, and so on. So this resource offers one more way to condition our audience to the new world of unified product info. And the last example focuses on how we used our site structure <clears throat> to help new and existing customers find the right content. Two of the unified guides ended up being fairly large. The setup guide clocking in at roughly 180 pages in PDF and the admin guide coming in at around 100 pages. We weren't concerned with the length because we were confident in our data map structure and how we chose to arrange our topics. But we also knew that our audiences would appreciate an extra layer of guidance. To meet this goal, we established what we call middleman pages, which is what I'm showing on the screen here, which are AEM web pages that offer blocks of content that highlight the chapters of the guide. The purpose of this page is to allow the user to quickly scan the available segments of content, choose the one that they are interested in at that moment, and then jump to that specific section of the guide.
So for example, if you are interested in creating UES administrator accounts, you can scan and visually scan and go through the setup page, see that specific block and then click it. And now you are in that section of the guide with relevant links to each topic that it contains, including the task topic to create an admin account, the reference topic for assigning administrator permissions, and so on and so forth. Now, by taking advantage of the core AEM platform and the flexible web design components that it offers, we created supporting resources that eased the transition to the new docs and conditioned our audiences to take a big picture approach to the UES solution. Challenge number five, the final challenge, make the docs part of the product. The final challenge we will cover today focuses on how we worked to make the docs an integral part of the product experience. I'm sure that every tech writer listening to this has heard the following feedback. I can't find the docs. In shaping the unified doc set, we wanted to make some key changes to the product so that any user could find the specific content that they needed right when they needed it. UES uses a browser-based console that allows IT admins to manage the various products and features in their environment. The console was originally designed to manage the Protect Desktop product, but over the years was expanded with new screens to manage additions to the product suite. What the console always lacked was a clear connection point to the customer docs. Throughout the console, there was nothing to let customers know where the product docs were or how to use them. While planning the unified docs, we worked with development to propose the inclusion of context sensitive help within the UES console. It was an initiative that our team had had much success with in other products, but this would be the most ambitious version of it. In a nutshell, this is what we proposed. Every screen in the console would include a help icon in the top right of the UI that when clicked would direct to a static URL. That static URL would be a redirect that our writers would be able to create, maintain, and update at any time in AEM. And it would redirect the user to the UES docs content that was specific to that screen. And what I'd actually like to do very briefly is to show you that in action. So I'll log in here to the console in one of our internal environments. Just do a quick authentication here with a sample account and it will jump to a page that has the context sensitive help experience in the top right corner. Hopefully it doesn't spin for too long. There we go. So here's a screen for assets, mobile devices. This is where you can view mobile devices that use a specific UES feature. And you can see here the top right corner has this help icon, uh, which is now contained on nearly every screen in the console. And behind each help icon is a unique static URL that when clicked, will jump you to the specific docs topic via a redirect that our team manages that gives you this the targeted task content or whatever is the most relevant content for that specific screen. Uh, the help experience is the same regardless of the backend design differences on the development side. And the help link will always land you in the right context that will help customers for that specific screen. Thanks to quite a bit of diligence and many dev tickets, we were ultimately successful in our goal. The live console now features a help link on almost every screen and the remaining outliers should get resolved in the coming months. We consider this to be a huge accomplishment. Not only can our customers access help at the moment of need from within the product, but this will also allow them to build more familiarity with our doc set and understand the help resources that we make available to them at all times. Lastly, there's one other change that we are working on implementing right now that also serves the goal of intrinsically linking the product UI to the docs. The UES console includes a built-in how-to guide as basic strings in a section of the UI, which is what I've thrown on screen here. So you can see here, it's a, it's a fairly simple in the built-in help design whereby you click on items on the left and it displays strings on the right. Now offering help strings within the UI makes the content hard to maintain because it demands the creation of a development ticket every time you want to make a change. On top of that, the content is a bit out of date and lacking that new unified solution focus. Now to us in docs, the answer to this was clear. Adopt a more modern help model by taking those strings out of the console and replacing them with a new UES console overview 
which is what I've shown on screen here, that we could offer on our docs website. Once again, designed and created using our AEM web templates. And in this case, we take advantage of some nice accordion components available in AEM to mimic that same type of design whereby you click something in the left and it displays dynamically content on the right. Uh, and we effectively redesign the resource to mimic the latest UI and to give more information and more detailed information about all of the different screens and what you can do with them. Now this re new resource offers many advantages. We could expand the content to address every UES product and feature. The console could simply link to this resource, which Docs would own and update in step with every single release. We could update it at any time, unencumbered by sprint processes or code reviews. And the main goals of this resource would be, number one, to clarify the purpose of every screen in the console, and number two, it would include links to the official UES docs for complete information. It would serve as yet another way to drive customers to our valuable data content. This ongoing effort, along with the work we have already done and continue to do with context sensitive help, will both contribute to my career dream of never having to hear, I can't find the docs ever again. So in conclusion, the features of the AEM Guides CMS and its tight integration with the core AEM platform provided us with the tools, freedom, and flexibility to answer the many challenges we faced in rebuilding our content to meet the needs of the business and our customers. Before we move on to the live Q&A, I just wanted to share my email and LinkedIn on the screen. Uh, please feel free to connect with me. I always enjoy chatting and comparing notes with my fellow tech writers. And a very sincere thank you to everyone who is kind enough to take the time to attend my session today. I very much look forward to speaking to some of you in the live Q&A. Thank you. Welcome everybody. My name is Bernard Ashwan, and I'm here with Valerie Stafford from Erie, and we're going to talk through their adventure uh, as they work their way through Data Land. There was some really interesting work done along the way. This pre-recorded session is going to be available to everybody so that you can find out what was done, why it was done, but we're also going to use some of the pods in the live portion of the conference in order to record things. Do feel free to ask your questions. We'll answer them there and we'll try to summarize them at the end as well. My name is Bernard. I am the founder and president of a company called Publishing Smarter. I'm based in Algoma Mills in Ontario, Canada. If you know roughly where New York is, just go north from New York for about uh, 10 hours and you'll get pretty much right to my place. It's a little bit of a drive, maybe 15 hours. Uh, Valerie, you're not that far away from me. You're almost due south in Erie, Pennsylvania, but do you want to uh, do a self-introduction and then we'll move ahead from there? Sure. So I'm Valerie Stafford and I am the Knowledge Management Department Manager at Erie Insurance. And like Bernard said, we're not that far from him. We're located in Erie, Pennsylvania, which is in the top leftmost corner of Pennsylvania, right on Lake Erie. Um, I've been with Erie for almost 33 years in various positions, primarily related to technical writing. And most recently, we've added knowledge management to our technical writing services that we provide. We have been developing in DITA since 2011, and my entire team enjoys working with DITA. Over the years, we started to encounter more and more issues with the various tools and processes that we use. Finally, we reached a point where we realized we need to make some changes for both our authors and our readers. So this presentation walks you through the journey that we've had through what I'm calling data land. And that was kind of a fun one from my perspective as an outsider. So we're going to be going through some of the initial steps, some of the discovery that you did, the hazards that you found along the way after you got to data. Uh, using the metaphor of that journey, how did you find that roadside assistance partner? And what type of work did we do together as we traveled from start to end? Where are you now? And then also to explore a little bit of what's next, because that's always an interesting one. 
you you had this winding road and it was always this path forward and you got to a certain point and you said, we're here. This is now the start of our data adventure. Do you want to give us a little breakdown on that? Sure. So initially we authored and published using a mainframe library management system, which worked well. It was tag driven. And then at some point over the years, we converted all of our documents to a desktop word processing tool because that was the thing to do at that time. And then DITA uh, became very popular and we converted all of our documents to DITA using a laptop a data publishing and authoring tool. And we've been using that ever since. And we felt like we reached our destination, DITA, and we were successful. And when was this? That was in 2011. So here we are 10 years later. And at that point, 10 years ago, you already had DITA success. And there, there was everything that you needed to have, except that there were some of these hazards. What what we found when we work with companies is often they achieve something. And it's a great baseline. It's that stake where you can say, this is where we are now. But over the years, and it's never through ill intent. It's not that somebody is trying to sabotage. It's that technology moves forward. There's discovery. There are workflows that change. There's additional desire to do things. So companies end up realizing that some of their tools their, their environment is a little left behind and they need to start to move forward. Uh, but they've built certain things that work for them, but not for the long term. It's a solution for now. And you start to realize, I've got this access database. I've got this Excel spreadsheet. I've got this combination of pieces that are floating around out there. And all of a sudden, the solution that looked great 10 years ago, five years ago, starts to change. So can you give a, a little bit of an idea of some of those experiences you had? Sure, and you summarized a lot of what we experienced. Um, so in 2012, we experienced a change in senior management and technical writing was not considered part of the critical path. So we weren't able to get funding or any real focus on even upgrading our authoring and publishing tool. So that has never been upgraded to this day. And then in 2013, we started to encounter software and hardware issues. And we didn't encounter them all at once, but the issues just kept mounting as the time went on. Not only was our authoring and publishing tool not upgraded, but we also had to use Windows 7 and Internet Explorer to run it. Oh, and then our um, CMS user interface was no longer supported and scheduled for sunset. And without that, we'd be relegated to a command line user interface, which would be a major step backwards for us. That's awesome. But think of the graphics. You'd be able to go down to like a 16-bit video card again. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, we also had a custom-built connector to connect our authoring tool with our CMS, and the custom-built connector was no longer supported. Erie is currently replacing our CMS, so this soon will also be unsupported. We used an outdated version of an access database to track all of our metadata. We actually created that ourselves, the technical writing group at the time, and we have continued to use that until just very recently, and that had never been upgraded. Then our authoring software server needed to be upgraded to meet infrastructure standards. Every step of the way, it just kind of getting we, started, we just found more and more issues, and it became more difficult to work in the environment that we were in. I'm guessing everybody's trying to help along the way. Somebody's coming along and saying, oh, you need to connect these things together. We can build that for you. Great. Here's a piece. And then somebody else comes along and says, oh, you need to publish, or you need to have a way to track which files are in what status and who's doing what. So you build and build and build because initially, again, 10 plus years ago, the tools didn't have these features. And you end up having this bit of a Frankenstein's monster of components where everything's being brought together with the best intention, but uh, the villagers show up with pitchforks because they don't necessarily understand how all of these pieces that are disconnected come together into something that's a really nice solution. Yeah, that summarizes it because we, uh, we're the only ones in the company that use DITA. So there is no other DITA expertise in the company. You know, we know a lot about authoring and publishing in DITA. 
but we certainly don't have that technical background. And when you mentioned data, there's there's a lot of best practice that's in there. Some companies like specialization, some don't. Um, as you build, especially if you're creating content early, there might not be a formal reuse model. You've got a lot of different people working with the system. Maybe deviation because there's more than one way to do it. Uh, I have an engineer friend, and his his line that I love is, uh, "The great thing about standards is that there's so many to choose from." <laughs> so there's there's a lot of these different things that are in the world of data, and that was not necessarily implemented as well as it could be because you were still learning. So can you go through that a little? The data and the best practice. Yeah, I mean, we we thought we were doing things right, and I think we did for the most part at that time. Uh, but we did have some specialization. Um, we knew that we would have the opportunity to use, reuse topics and content, and we did very little of that uh, because we weren't able to really determine an easy way to identify topics that could be reused, so they weren't. All right. Yeah, reuse candidates, always fun. Yes. It's like mentally, you know, I've got all of these things that I can reuse, but where, where, uh, shoot, now I've got to go back and continue to do my work. Exactly. And so you recreate it, knowing you recreate it. And then you think, well, I'll go back later and look for it. And then you're on to the next project. So that doesn't And then you get that panic, right? Where somebody comes along and says, oh, could you change and update this? And you think, oh, I, I know I wrote something like that somewhere else. Then you try to find it and you can't. Exactly. <laughs> We've all experienced that. Yeah. And then, over and the, then 10, the authors, how many did you have over the last 10 years? Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. So over the last, well, since 2011 or so, we've had, at one time, we had 22 authors. And then we had others that were broadening into technical writing and, and that. So we have many more people than that that were in uh, our tool and authoring and data. So we had a lot of best practices. Everyone that we onboarded, we had a very good onboarding program designed to make sure people understood how to use the data tags and what our best practices were or are. And they weren't always followed, obviously. And over the course of time, it gets messier and messier. We also had some clever formatting. We've got a lot of large uh, tables in some of our documents. And so our I want to say clever or non-standard data formatting is not a good thing. Any tracking or reporting that I did, and I still do, is manual. And so that takes a lot of time, and it's very difficult to compare apples to apples monthly, quarterly, yearly, when you're looking in multiple places to get your data so that you can report. And we've never had the ability to provide metrics and if I had a dime for every time somebody asked me, well, how often is this used? I can't tell them. So. Wow. Yeah. I, I know there was the uh, spreadsheet. We'll talk about that a little later on. There was the um, access database that was mentioned. There's a lot of different components that sort of come together that are the, here's the good and here's the weak of what we're putting together. So there was the hardware, software, the technical aspect of it, there was the implementation aspect of it, and I'm guessing it, it's not even necessarily left hand, right hand, it's that the entire collective brain and the nervous system are, are all trying to move forward, but they're working in a bit of a disjointed way, and again, not through any intent, just because there's so many things that everybody wants to contribute that you run into the challenge of how do we bring all of this back to a common starting point so that we can go in and say, that's where we were, this is where we now are. If I look at that that starting point into your next phase, if we continue with this idea of a journey, you had come along, you had your get to know each other, you had your get married, have your honeymoon phase with Dita, things were good. Then along the way, you hit not the seven year, but the 10 year itch of things are a little different. And, and you thought, all right, we're going to rekindle this relationship between all of the different aspects of and head out on this new aspect of a journey. So walk me through a little bit. Where were you uh, 2018-ish, a few years ago, when you got ready to start on this next phase? And actually, just doing the math, 2018, that is almost the seven-year itch. It really is a, a relationship with Dita. 
Yeah, so you're right. Our our new journey started in 2018, and that's after we moved out of the division that didn't consider us part of the critical path and into another division where uh, we had the support from my manager, Karen Skorupski, who's a vice president at Erie, and also the executive vice president that she reported to at the time. So fortunately, we had the support and backing that we needed to get a project in place and approved so that we could uh, start to look at replacing our current uh, tool set. And once we did that, uh, we evaluated several tools and selected what we felt would be the best tool for us, which is Adobe Experience Manager. Knowing we didn't have any data experts in-house, it was a no-brainer to reach out to actually you, Publishing Smarter. Uh, we worked with you and um, your company several years back on some things, and it went very well. And, of course, we know you from various uh, conferences that we've been to and stuff. So I immediately said we need to get Publishing Smarter engaged, and then we pursued that. That was fun. And every time, so I've had a couple of opportunities to drive around down through to the uh, to the U.S. and through Buffalo and then past the Erie exits. And I can actually look over and go, I know that. If I exit here and I go north, I'm going to get to the offices, <laughs> which is kind of fun. It's, it's nice to see those things. So at this point, we're sort of 2018, 2019, 2020, and you're starting to get into that moment of, you know, common hindsight and vision. And 2020 sort of gives us both of those. 2020 vision, you've got this focus of where you want to go, or 2020 vision of hindsight. You knew where you were. You knew what some of the issues had been early on. If we then look at moving from that 2018 line in the sand date-ish of there's things we need to do, now we come along and we say moving forward. I think one of the first things we did was a, a deeper analysis of your content, trying to figure out what do you have and looking at all of the different things. That spreadsheet of yours, the files that you have, the volume of information, can you talk a little bit about, because you had a ton of stuff. It was just fragmented. It was very fragmented. So the access database that I mentioned was our Bible that had all of our metadata in it. And it goes back as far as there's, still fields in there for uh, three ring binder size and sheet lifters and sheet protectors and all those things when we were publishing in paper. Since none of us really had the skills or the time to maintain it in 2018, you know, it was like, okay, we need to capture other information metadata because a lot of what's in the access database doesn't apply anymore. And the things we really do need to be tracking, I don't have a place for them. So I created a, an Excel spreadsheet to house all those new fields that we needed. That was great, except for then we still had to use, we were still using the Access Database as our Bible for some things, but then other things we were using the Excel spreadsheet for. So we, my team had to update things in two places. It certainly wasn't ideal. They don't like doing that. <laughs> Um, and then you had to look multiple places to do any kind of reporting that I was trying to do, too. So, yeah, that's that's been pretty ugly. And we are so thankful to be off the access database. And we can't wait to get off the Excel spreadsheet so that we can do all most of our managing into uh, in AEM. The, the analysis was great. I mean, knowing all of this stuff existed um, really helped me. I started looking at some of this and I got a good feel for so many different components of your information, started to look at it. And I thought there's, there's two ways that metadata is really useful. One is for the consumer of the content, for somebody to be able to go in and get targeted information that's applicable because they're looking for information on fire or they're looking auto or they're looking for home. But there's also the metadata and the information that's used that helps the creators of the content, the curators, your team. And that was the other thing that I thought was really nice. You actually had both types of information. You knew who your audience was. You had things configured for your writers. And it really made it a little easier because you had already done a lot of the core analysis or you had tracked a lot of the information. 
to then come along and take that and say, let's build a consolidated sheet so that we can put together a system and we can design this way that we can take your legacy materials, run it through a set of workflows, and then be able to either automatically clean it up and add the things that matter or manually go back and deal with some of the exceptions so that we could ingest content. And I know that there were a lot of different people from a lot of teams involved. Can you expand a bit on some of the design aspects that we put together, not for look and feel, but for function, so that you could get what you needed ready so that we could load it into AEM? You, I can't stress enough the importance of reviewing and analyzing your files and really knowing them inside out. Um, we identified non-standard file names and non-standard data formatting and customizations. And then, I'm laughing. One of your file names, I remember there's a file called null15. <laughs> that was awesome. Definitely didn't follow our standards, yes. And we've been working with Bernard to develop a new Erie branded map and book map templates. Very closely examined our metadata. And then we determined and configured our AEM folder structure because we want all of our individual yeah. documents in their own folder so that it's easy to find. They're easy to find. And then we work together on the file ingestion process to prepare our files for ingestion and develop a master spreadsheet for ingestion purposes. I'm, I'm blown away by the amount of information that sort of came together because I think that spreadsheet had, what, 15, 20,000 different topics by the end of this. Right. And we've figured out a way with you in order to make the content as findable as possible, not only for the readers of the content, but also for those who are going to be, as I mentioned, creating and curating. So at this point, you're at, at that ready to start to implement. We're training. We are loading sample files, we're starting to get to the point of ingestion of larger materials. Where, where's your implementation vision? What are some of the things now that you're sort of here today, literally within a week or two of when the conference is happening, we're, we're starting to go live? Right, so um, just today, we reviewed our metadata tabs. I worked with Nathan, we reviewed the metadata tabs that he's creating, they're looking great. The ingestion spreadsheet is ready. So once he has the metadata ingestion or schema uh, tab set up, then he'll be able to use that spreadsheet to test the implementation into our non-prod environment. And in preparing for that, I also did a lot of manual cleanup on things that weren't standard so that they will not have an issue going into AEM but I had to keep track of what I did because those things are probably not going to work for us after we're in AEM. So I need to go back and make the proper adjustments after the ingestion uh, so that the authors don't have issues when they get assigned an update. I want them to be able to just do the update and not have to figure out uh, what the problem is before they can do the update. And I remember uh, looking at workflow. One of the things we, we looked at is what's your review? Because it's not just create the content, send it to a subject matter expert, get a little bit of feedback, and then send it out the door. You have some interesting workflow challenges that are coming along as well because you have, hey, fellow authors of content, do a review. Hey, subject matter experts, do a review. Hey, internal resources, do a review. I'm always interested to see during the, the discovery phase, what do we have that comes up that's going to impact that implementation? And you're getting so many good combinations of things that are going to come from the from your AEM guides environment that you can just go in and say, this is where we are, this is where we're going. And again, it's this journey part. You're at the point where you've got your plan, you've got your roadmap, you know where your stops are along the way, you've already booked your hotels, you know that when you're in town, you're going to go to this concert and you're going to eat at that restaurant. So it's really nice to look at it and and see you know this clear vision out the front window. Yeah, we're such we're at such an exciting place right now because now we're seeing it all start to come together, and our trainings right down the road. My team is so excited, and they I can't tell you how many times they've said, "I can't wait till we don't have to use Windows Seven anymore." <laughs> it's freezing up. Um, you just you know they're just 
going to be so happy when we can streamline everything. So we're all eagerly awaiting the training. Excellent. As we start to get back to this idea of destination data, that was your destination years ago. Right. There have been changes along the way. The road is winding, and at times you don't necessarily double back onto the same road, but it might be that you loop around and you look down and you go, hey, we were just over there two months ago, and we can see where we were, and we can also have this vision looking forward. There is success to be had, and a lot of those high-level companies, when they go out and they succeed, they do so because they have that state-of-the-art type of an environment. They're not on the bleeding edge. They're not necessarily trying to do something that is just on the other side of 10 minutes or a month or a year from now, but they're also not back 10 years ago. And you are at this point of success. You've got your authoring and your publishing tool. You've got updates to that. You're changing over your operating system and environment. Um, you're cleaning up the number of external tools, plugins, uh, supporting pieces that exist. So that's sort of my next question. This destination that you're sort of arriving at now, what are some of the big things in regards to this, this first set of bullets that really stands out in your mind? So we're moving from an authoring uh, desktop, authoring and publishing tool to the cloud, which will use Windows 10 so we can get rid of our virtual Windows 7 session. We'll be able to use AEM as the repository. Um, our current situation was we had to store things in our CMS, so that was another step that we had to take to get our uh, source files stored. And then we're going to reduce the number of software that we actually have to use for authoring and publishing in half. And that's going to be nice because it just saves us a few, you know, pickups and drop-offs. My team's very excited about that as well. And you're going to be losing that Excel spreadsheet, which I'm sure is a real heartbreak for you. Um, <laughs> access, is that part of that six to three reduction? The yep. access side, the Excel side? Yep. Um, there's some definite efficiencies that are going to be coming into play because you're going to have everything in one place. You're not necessarily going to have to leave and find the most current version. Are you still at that, uh, how many writers was it? 22 writers 12 no, years ago? We have, I have a team of five and then myself. So it's changed. So the all. expectation is do more with less? Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. And again, um, this is this is something that we've been looking at with a lot of clients is the idea of the great resignation. We have a lot of people who have a lot of experience in an organization, and there's not a ton of people who are backfilling those roles. And it's nothing to do with the companies. It is, in, in North America at least, it is purely demographics. If we look at, literally, there was the baby boom. There were families having five kids, eight kids, 10 kids in some cases, and then it's down to three kids, four kids, and down to one or two. Right. And it's nice to see that you as an organization are starting to look at what can we do in order to do more with less. And part of that is updating that technology. And another part of it is updating the best practices. I know we've worked to remove the specializations. Not that specializations are good or evil, um, it's just that they're not needed in your environment. Uh, we're starting to play with the idea of additional data functions, the reuse, the automation that's available, uh, the, the idea of finding things and working with metadata, um, tracking metrics, of course. So I thought maybe you can explore those in a little more detail for a few minutes. Sure. So, um, yeah, like I said, we didn't have a lot of specialization, but we really just wanted to go as vanilla as possible. Uh, just to keep things simple and streamlined, uh, we definitely want to increase our reuse. And using AEM, we're going to be able to easily determine the content and topics that are out there. They're going to be in a reuse folder so that we know where to even look for them. And the system will tell you where things are used. And that is so different from what we have now. Um, one of the things that we're super excited about is the automated review and approval process. So right now, we publish everything in PDFs, and we have to attach the PDF 
to an email and send it out to any kind of subject matter expert for review and approval. So we exchange those back and forth and it works, but we want to be able to do that. And we are going to do that using AEM's automated process. So we're going to be working with Bernard to get that set up. We also want to move from not just publishing to PDFs, but publishing HTML. So that's going to be much easier for us to do in this tool. That's hopefully not too far down the road. Uh, we are going to improve our metadata and findability. This analysis that we did for the metadata getting ready for ingestion has helped us really look at what we have and what we don't have. And that's going to help us determine what we need to do and what we will do going forward. And then I'm probably most excited about the improved automated tracking and reporting because my team members don't have to do that, but I do. And I just can't wait until I can get some reports set up where I can push a button and it gives me the information that I need. And metrics is huge. I mean, how do you how do you sell a product or how do you know what to focus your time on if you can't determine who your audience is or how often it's used or how important it is. So those are big hitters for us, all those things. There's a couple of good things that came to mind. The reuse idea, just taking your content and doing the analysis and then doing the rewrite so that it becomes far more precise than you can go through and say, this is exactly what we have, standardizing your phrasing, making it easier, taking advantage of that task concept reference. The findability, I've said this in so many sessions, searching sucks, all right? Apologies to Google and others. Nobody ever wants to do a search. You want to find. I, I don't want to go searching for information on how I put in a claim after my car is stolen. I want to find the information. More importantly, I don't even want to find the information. I want my insurance company to step up and say, sorry to hear the bad news. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to get you a rental immediately until such time as you're able to go out and get yourself a new vehicle. Type, type behind the scenes. Here's all the information that I as an agent need to be passing on to somebody. And it's just there. I love the idea of somebody saying, oh, we've documented this entire workflow and all of this. And someone turns around and goes, oh, yeah, I don't use that. <laughs> and then you get all sad and you say, what do you mean you don't use it? We spent a lot of time building it. No, you know what? The answers are already here on screen in front of me. You sit there and you go, that's the system. That's the thing we built. And it's wonderful because they don't even realize how much easier their, their life has, has become when it comes to what they need to do day to day at work. And metrics, I love the idea of also finding the bottom 10. Everybody's about the top 10. What are the things that are, what about the bottom 10? Because you're spending time and effort to build it. Maybe the keywords aren't the right ones. Maybe it's not being found because it's no longer necessary to, to teach people or explain some of those basic pieces. I think where you are and what you're doing is fantastic. And overall, you're at a starting point again. This time, I think there's a key difference from where you were 10 plus years ago, though. And uh, I, would, I would put that towards the idea of data is far more mature. The tools that are on the market are far more all-encompassing in what they're capable of doing. You don't need to have a separate tool to do so many of the different things that you're looking at in this, this consolidated slide view of where you are. So moving forward, I don't think you're going to have to go back 10 years later and say, well, we've got to revisit. But what is, what's next? What are some of the things that you're thinking are going to be six months, a year, and five years, or 10 down the road? You mentioned the idea of having online, of having these metrics. Um, what's your vision beyond that? Yeah, I would really, I'd really like to see AEM sites be our repository for, or I should say, our end user interface. We'll see if I can make that happen down the road. We need a better end user repository that's more friendly. I definitely want to move toward HTML publishing. I'd like to be able to provide more web type content than PDFs. You've got people that like the PDFs because that's what they've used for so many years. But you have a lot of people out there that really don't want to look through a PDF or a book type format. And search in general would be so much nicer just in the HTML format. So I can see us moving more toward that, hopefully not too far down the road. And if we get it right, you'll be able to take advantage of things like a chat agent and actually have one that's friendly 
and uh, a little more intuitive because behind the scenes, your content's in better shape. There's several ways that I know from my own experiences, we had a huge windstorm that knocked down a tree and I had to get in touch with insurance and there was damage. And the conversation was so quick and painless when we finally got to sort of, you know, the right people who were able to have the right conversations about the types of things. But that phone system of press one for this and two for that, mm-hmm. those are things that I, I'm so looking forward to going away so that we can have that natural conversation like we are right now in order to find exactly what's needed. You and your team have been awesome to work with. I've been really, really happy. So uh, thank you, Valerie, for the support that you've given us along the way, the trust that you've put into us uh, so that we can help, you know, so that you can trust in your content. And uh, to Karen and to others who have been involved up along the chain in the organization for this session as well, a uh, quick shout out. Thank you, uh, Stefan, the rest of the team over at Adobe, those of you who have attended. And uh, Valerie, I'll turn it over to you um, for sort of the, the last word on thank yous and so on. And we'll keep an eye on the chat and answer questions if there's others that come up. But uh, Valerie, I'll turn it over to you and then we'll wrap up. Sure. So I'd like to extend a thank you to you and Nathan and others and Publishing Smarter for everything that you've done and continue to do for us. We would not be where we're at without you and your expertise. So we appreciate all of you more than you know. And again, I'd like to thank Karen Skorupski for the support that she has given us and continues to give us, my manager at Erie and the executive vice president that supported her as well, and everyone at Erie that's helping us meet our destination. So thank you very much. Thanks again, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you for joining my talk today and thank you Adobe for having me in this TITA conference. It is a pleasure to speak at this great Adobe event today. CRX.net has been an Adobe partner for a very long time and works very closely with Adobe to solve our customers' problems and challenges, both technically and conceptually. In addition to our own CRX.net products, which deal with the automation of content processes from creation to delivery to the end users, we use and integrate Adobe products such as FrameMaker in combination with Dita to bring out the, the best possible for our customers. Our topic of today is building content bridges. Why content needs to flow like water. Let us look at information a little differently, a little bit more picture-like in the next half hour. Let us see information like water. Information must flow like water. Information must be formless and adapt to our environment, just like water does. This is how you prefer to see and have information calm and without stress, simply sunny and warm. Just there to jump in and feel free. And this is how your customers and users wants to have your information. They want to have the information or the content they consume to be exciting. Users on our platforms want to make experiences and they want to get inspired. And in case of technical information, Users want to get information they need very fast and they expect information should come to them whenever and wherever they need it. Information has just to be there, nearly invisible and information has to do one thing. It just has to flow. Topic of this talk is building content bridges. And now you ask yourself, perhaps, if information just flows like water, why do we need bridges? It's simple. We don't want information to flow somehow. We don't 
generate knowledge if information just flow somehow. We need to build bridges for information to get information where it needs to go. We need to control the flow of information via information bridges. When information flows independently, we do not speak of a controlled process. But this controlled process is exactly what we need. The Romans recognized this over 2000 years ago and controlled the, the flow of water with an aqueduct. Water was exactly where it was needed, in the city, in the bathrooms and in the bathhouses. And the water just flowed through channels and aqueducts built by people. And of course, we have evolved since then. Each house has sanitary facilities, taps in almost every room for the different applications, for flushing, for showering or bathing, or for gardening. As soon as you open this tap, water arrives where you need it. And when you no longer need it, here but elsewhere, you close the tap and then you open it somewhere else, perhaps to water your flowers. And this is what the digitalization of information processes means. Bring information to, the, to your users whenever and wherever they need it. And even more, know your users and the situation they are in and bring them the information they need right at this point and preferably before they even know they need it. And one more. Information must be made available from central sources in such a dynamic and automated way that it is best tailored for the users in their specific situation. Information is only good if it is understood quickly and turned into knowledge as quickly as possible. So if we want information to flow like water, we need to talk to talk about digitalization. Because information only flows when it is digital and above all identifiable. When information is identifiable, it is on its way to become knowledge. Once this is achieved, we have developed a knowledge graph and network which we can combine inf information into new knowledge in various ways just like our brain does. The digital transformation has only just begun, but we are already in the middle of it. Let's make sure we don't get left behind, especially not behind of our competitors. That would be fatal because we would not only lose digital business, but also miss the path of the future with a great risk that our company will probably no longer exist in the future. Digitalization has many aspects, of course. In our contents, when we talk about digitalization topics, we are mainly talking about editorial content in technical documentation, marketing, or more generally in product management. Of course, we are not talking about digits of zeros and ones when we talk about digital transformation. No one writes his content on a typewriter anymore. Or do you? Be honest. No, you don't. Hopefully. It's about digitalizing processes. And ultimately, that means we need to look at automating content processes. In very simple terms, how does our information in the company and about the products get to our customers and users? How does this content flow in an automated way to whoever is interested? We have to remember that not only humans are interested in our content, increasingly machines, or more exactly, 
pieces of software are also interested in our content. They want to get the content they need in certain situations. No more, no less. And of course, nobody wants to search for information anymore. Rather, we expect to get the information automatically, whenever or better before it's needed. And that not only means that our information must be machine readable, more than that, it means that information must be discoverable and identifiable. And even more than that, it means that information must be provided in the format in which our users need it. But if our users are also machine, what do they need? They need more than a stupid 1000 peach PDF. They somehow also need more than a modernized HTML5 files. Maybe they even need a completely different format, a format over which we can control our machines with the help of the documentation. Maybe a format Machines can even control themselves with information they read themselves from the info, from the documentation. But first we have to ask ourselves the question, what do our customers want? And who are these customers anyway? Today you say our customers are satisfied. And then they suddenly run away because they discovered something else something better somewhere. If someone comes along with a better digital offer, the customer who was just satisfied is gone. Customers, especially younger ones, become dissatisfied if they notice break in the flow of information. Have you ever booked a hotel or event online and then you had, fill, had to fill out all your information again on the paper at the check-in, so the concierge could then type it back into his system by hand, then you understand what such breaks in flow of information mean. These breaks in information flow and media not only make you dissatisfied, it also shows very clearly that the company is not up to date. The same applies to our product information. That's why you should always reinvent yourself and your product information, or rather your delivery process. Satisfaction is not a shame, but we have to become more dissatisfied and question everything we do. And now you ask yourself, how often should you do that? And how often should you uh, do you have this question? to question yourself. The answer is simple, always. We have to ask ourselves again and again, is what we are doing today still okay tomorrow? And do our customers still want this tomorrow? Or do they not expect something different? Especially in the user experience and the customer journey within our digital company, our digital twin, of the company. This satisfaction must become our permanent companion in our business strategies, but also in our content strategies. And at least now you ask yourself, if we have to revent our information again and again, how is, this, how is that supposed to work? We have so much content, we cannot keep reinventing and revising it, right? That's why we have to talk about automation and establish two operating systems in our company from now on. In the next few years, we have two major tasks. Preserving old structure where it makes sense, destroying old structures and rebuild them where necessary. So in the future, we will need two ways of looking at things. And therefore, we need to establish two operating systems. The first operating system is focused on the inside. 
Here we must focus on our data and our internal business processes. The second operating system is directed to the outside. An outside that becomes more and more dynamic and challenges us more and more. We have to be able to react quickly to these dynamic developments. Of course, it is ideal if we would not only react, but also act and are in the forefront, taking on the role of a first mover or, or a fast follower. The first operation, operating system is internal, focused on our data and our internal business processes. In terms of technical documentation, there are the processes of content creation and management, quality assurance, translation, and content publishing. Essentially, it's about stability and process real reliability and holism and sustainability must be a key part of our content strategy. We can't keep adapting content just because the outside changes. The holistic and sustainable view in this context means that we look at tomorrow when we attack something today. But as a consequence, this also means that we have to think more abstractly when we create our content and provide it with metadata. How do we need to create our content if we get a new requirement that we don't know at all? If we look at our company from the inside, we realize that we have to take care of two types of silos. On the one hand, tools and systems, the technological side. Content is managed in these silos and often do not have the necessary openness to share this information with other systems. On the other hand, the organizational structures, which are very rigid and often not able to collaborate with other entities. On the technology side, we often have the problem that information is stored redundantly in different systems. We have to make sure that we maintain the content where it belongs and establish the single point of truth. The single point of truth, the only one, take a look at your business and many truths are there today, right? Only one, hopefully there is only one, but I'm pretty sure there are several truths. Removing redundancies leads us to this one truth. Why are we maintaining our technical data in our PIM system and in our CCMS? This is because we have different domains. These different domains leads to different systems, PIM and CCMS. We need one truth in one of these systems and we need to connect these domains, these systems, to get access to the truth wherever we need it. It is important that the truth is created one, only once where it really belongs. And that an automatic data exchange is made possible via pro programmatic interfaces, so-called APIs. Besides SIFT systems, even organization often fights for themselves. What I'm increasingly seeing is that super cool industry followed all use cases implemented in various forms in the service sector, for example. For these use cases, technical documentation is essential. Development in this area notices that documented documentation is important. Cool, you realize at first glance. Someone from outside has broken through the wall to documentation. And then you go deeper into detail and you find a thousand pages PDF. A thousand pages PDF containing six languages and more. The PDF has been pulled somewhere from your document management system. Nobody consulted the technical documentation department. No writer really knows what happens there Nobody has a look to the outside and no one cares about users. If they had communicated, they would have found a sustainable and holistic approach 
that brings real added value for customers. Of course, we need these silos to continue to operate effectively and efficiently. High data quality and low error tolerance help us to offer cost-effective products. Costs will continue to play an important role in the future, of course. Therefore, the focus insight must clearly be on stability. So we don't need to tear down our silos, but we need to break them open. We need to build bridges, knock down walls and put in doors so that departments and system can communicate with each other. To keep your content stable, we need to think about it differently. We must no longer think in terms of table of contents. We have to modularize our content and work topic oriented, taking care of identifiable of information. We need to fully automate everything that doesn't affect the creation process. The translation process is a candidate for this. Why do we still have to translate our content manually and do not do machine translation? When we automate translation, translation is only one more output channel, as well as publishing a PDF. Take a moment and think about that. If our source content is perfect, why do we think that things will, which can be automated must be perfect as well? Good enough is more than often just good enough. Moving to automation frees up resources, labor and money. Put these free resources in further optimizations of digital processing. Take a firm, further moment and think about this too. We keep hearing terms like user experience, design or customer journey in our second operating system. So we are aligning ourselves with the outside. And outside this is becoming more and more dynamic and challenging us more and more. We have to be able to react quickly to this dynamic outside. It's simply a matter of delighting our customers and users, in other words, the market. This requires flexibility on the one hand, but above all, a culture of error that allows us to fail a culture of error that makes many startups so successful today. Today we have contact with our customers in various ways, in person and increasingly digitally via our web portals or on our so social media. Do you notice anything? Right, web portals, plural. Have you ever tried to find information about your device on this website of one of your suppliers? a piece of information that you need very urgently? Very often you don't find the information where you are looking. Or you need ages to navigate through the different portals to find the information that is important for you. Most of the time you end up in a thousand page multilingual PDF again. Disappointed, often very disappointing. If you look at websites of various manufacturers, you can find systems like websites, help and support centers, portals for documentation, various cloud portals, especially in the environment of industry 4.0, are growing like mushrooms from the ground. What do you find if you find something? Right, you find PDFs. Tons of PDFs, not enabled for full text search, of course not. All of these portals are silos, sometimes very big silos. Not connected, just a link from a link, which was a link from another link, in best cases. Of course, the topic of user experience is written large in each of these individual touch points. A user experience or even a customer journey in total is something we find very rarely. And this is all somehow symbolize our company identity. Therefore, from a customer or user perspective, we need to gradually tear down our silos and bring the content to the user where they are, where they need it. We need to find one door, one entry point to our information 
and at the same time implement multiple touch points so that our customers can find the information from anywhere and I mean anywhere. By the way, high-end is not when your customers find the information quickly. High-end is when the information finds your customer. Imagine you are looking for a specific spare part for your machine. No matter how you come into contact with our content, perhaps through our website, the documentation or another portal, you want to be able to quickly find your needed spare part. You want to place an order quickly. And of course, you want to get shipped the needed part quickly as well. While the last and sometimes the second requirements work well, but finding the spare part or information to check if it's the one you really need is very annoying. No one knows the part number of the part you need, but that's the entry point most part portals provide. And even if you find the part, you don't know if it is really the part you need. You need additional information like technical data or the product hierarchy to know where this component is built in. You need this information about a certain item to make decisions. From a system perspective, the spare part catalog now needs access to the technical documentation. Click on the part in the exploded diagram and bang, the technical data is displayed. Automatically pulled from the documentation without having to store it twice in two systems. But if we think about it further, not only does the spare parts catalog need access to information in the, in the documentation, but the documentation also needs consistent access to the information in the spare parts catalog. Both systems must therefore be connected bidirectionally. For users, it must feel as if they are in one big single information ecosystem. It must feel like he is in our company. This is user experience. To achieve this, we need to break down some silos, but also intelligent content connect other silos. By this way, these two operating systems are the basic of the concept behind CREX.net. Now let's see what we need to build our content bridges from the inside to the outside and vice versa. It's quite easy. Anyone talks about this nowadays. Interfaces are key to success and interfaces are the pillars to build our bridges. Systems need open interfaces so that other system can access the information behind the connectors. So it needs at least two pillars. One with the interface, the provider, and another which implements this interface, the consumer. If you are using a system for accounting, you need an interface with your tax advisors. If the system does not provide an interface for data exchange, you should change the system immediately. And if your tax advisor says, no, we don't need such a thing, it works very fine the way it works with your paper in your carton, then you should change your tax advisor now, at latest now. The interfaces must be open and also provide native access down to the original data model. Only in this way is the information completely flexible and not dependent on use cases. If you need to select a new tool, put open interfaces as a basic requirement to your requirements list and check if it is open and flexible enough for your future needs. The Celts were already thinking ahead 4,000 years ago and carved our architecture for the digital age in stone. We need to build our pillars and bridges as the Celt did, did in Stonehenge to access all the available information, just to be able to build new things. In the beginning, all the pillars were connected. Today, that is no longer the case. Why? Because no one has continued to maintain and develop this building. So it is important that our operating system interfaces, data and processes are subject to a continuous improvement process. This also means to establish a person in the company who is responsible for digitalization. 
once the pillars are connected, you are following a clear corporate strategy and stable bridges can be built and maintained. Don't be afraid to tear down individual bridges in the futures and build new ones. Our world continues to turn from second to second and we have to be prepared for this. This is nothing wrong with failing, with admitting mistakes, but it's wrong not to learn from the past. Let's take new path and build new bridges and let's get connected. Thanks for your attention and thank you Adovin for having me in this great conference. Let this session close with some words of my childhood hero, Bruce Lee. This is what it is, okay? I said, empty your mind, be formless, shapeless, like water. Now you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Now water can flow or it can crash. Be water, my friend. If you want to see how we at CRX.net walk the talk, Join my session tomorrow noon about open API documentation, where I show you how content flows like water in practice. And now I'm looking forward to your questions and further discussions in the chat room. Hello everyone and welcome to this session for Adobe Ditto World 2022, Ditch the Developer with Native PDF Publishing in Adobe Experience Manager. My name is Chad. I am a Senior Solutions Consultant with Adobe Technical Communications. You can contact me at the uh, email address here you see on your screen and be happy to have a conversation with you around any of the features and things we're looking at here today or anything really to do with structured content management. Um, maybe a little late to the game here to uh, invite you to watch me present at Adobe Ditto World 2022 since you're already doing so, um, but uh, thank you for joining us in any event. So today I want to talk about um, PDF publication, how we've done that in the past, um, how we want to enable you to do that in the future with a low code uh, option that Adobe can provide. And so let's go ahead and get started. In the beginning, we used Dita OT or Dita Open Toolkit to publish our PDFs. And it was not so good. Right. If you're familiar with uh, the out of the box Ditto Open Toolkit PDF template, um, some of this next slide should look pretty familiar to you. So we had boring cover pages, right? Difficult to customize. Uh, nothing very interesting to look at here. I often liken it to walking down the generic aisle at the grocery store. We had unwanted white space. So we, um, you know, the uh, if we're publishing a book map into the OT, what we're going to see is, you know, if I have an empty chapter topic, for example, um, I'm going to have this kind of unwanted sort of weird looking white space. So I like the little uh, chapter table of contents there, um, but, uh, but certainly uh, there's room for improvement and also changing this layout uh, in the uh, default Ditto OT template is somewhat challenging. We also had some pretty un uninspiring page layouts, right? So you can see uh, just an example of that here um, where, you know, it gets the job done, um, but there's nothing particularly interesting about it. So we, we had a, you know, a, a tool available, did an open toolkit um, that is, um, you know, sort of the standard for for the starting point, at least for uh, for your PDF publication from Dita Content, right? Um, and all of this, you know, is is something that nearly every organization needs to customize, right? You want to have your your branding um, 
uh, reflected here within the environment. You want to have uh, some color, right? There's not a lot of color in, in here unless I in, in inject some images into, uh, into the content and so forth, right? So we really need to uh, think about this as a starting point, right? And then once we get into the, uh, the business of customizing this, um, that becomes very difficult, right? So it's very, very hard uh, to, uh, to customize this, uh, this out of the box PDF template using Ditto Open Toolkit. Um, it requires coding your, your layouts and, uh, and different things in a fairly esoteric language called XSLFO. Um, combine that with XSLT. Um, and you know, I've got, I still got a couple of books on my shelf from when I was learning to do this. My first did a project involved uh, developing a, uh, a custom PDF plugin for the organization I worked, at, uh, worked for at the time. And uh, just to give you a sense of what that looks like, right? It requires that coding in XSLFO, right? There's a lot of coding, right? You can see on the left side of this image, we've got some line numbers. Um, there are many, many lines of code that go into generating that PDF from Ditta content using the Ditta Open Toolkit. And the thing about XSLT and XSLFO is um, they're fairly esoteric, right? So I had to teach myself uh, those languages, um, do a lot of trial and error in order to get the results I was looking for. And it's a lot of work. It's a lot of uh, learning things that you aren't going to need really in any other context. And, uh, and it's just sort of slow and painful, right? And so the Ditta Open Toolkit is free, as in free beer, right? And that's great, right? We love, uh, we love open source tools. Um, we love the kind of power it gives us to, uh, to enable PDF generation, right? But that comes with a cost. And that cost can be expressed in a number of ways, right? It can be a financial cost in the form of hiring a consultant to do this work for you. It can come in the form of time, in the form of learning those languages I just mentioned, XSLT, XSLFO. Um, and there's a lot of coding. Um, there's a lot of iteration. Um, there's a lot of trial and error. And at the end uh, result is almost always a compromise. Right there's uh, there are some limitations to the Ditta Open Toolkit uh, with regards to what you can reasonably expect to achieve in uh, in terms of pay, page layouts and and things like that. Right now that's one option. Right, but there are of course others. As uh, if you've worked in this field uh, for any length of time, you're probably aware. Right, so there are third-party PDF formatters that typically run as plugins for the Ditto Open Toolkit. Um, so that's another option to give you some more, uh, more powerful controls over your page layouts and other types of design elements, right? Um, and of course, because we're Adobe, we of course love Adobe FrameMaker, which provides a, a template-based, um, sort of a GUI-based uh, tool to allow you to design these page layouts and get that print quality PDF uh, that a lot of organizations need. Right? But still, um, there are some, some asterisks right, to, uh, to mention there. Right? So in, you know, in any case, right, they still require some specialized skills. Right? Uh, you're not going to have an XSLFO developer on staff, typically. I mean, it's not always the case, but it's not uh, certainly uh, you know, so somebody that, uh, that you would typically have, particularly in a technical writing department. So there's, even with the third party formatters, right? There are um, you know, requirements to code in XSLT and XSLFO, really dig into um, those very, very cumbersome and heavy style sheets uh, that are a part of uh, not only Ditto Open Toolkit, but also uh, that are added on by some of these third-party formatters. Um, if you want to go the frame maker route, it's really great if you have 
some experience working with the templates and the templating system that's available within FrameMaker. It's very powerful, right? But it's also got a learning curve associated with it. So it's very difficult to get up and running quickly. And typically, we would recommend hiring a consultant um, or a partner or a developer to, uh, to actually do that work for you. Right? So a lot of times it's been uh, worked on in, um, you know, as sort of the, the first phase of the project, right? We're going to solidify and, and finalize our PDF uh, design, the look and feel of that PDF. Um, but then anytime you're looking to change that, maybe your company goes through a rebrand, right? So you shouldn't have to hire that developer again, uh, go back to that well, spend more money, more time, however you want to measure it. Uh, you shouldn't have to hire that developer um, to do things like changing the logo, right? Maybe our company's gone through uh, a rebrand activity, right? We need to swap out our logo and republish everything using that new branding. We shouldn't need to get a developer involved to make that happen. We shouldn't need a developer to add metadata from our data map, for example, to the header and footer of our document or to the cover page. Um, that should be something that we can accomplish ourselves in um, just a few clicks, right? So we want to make that really easy for you. If I want to add a new note style or, uh, heaven forbid, add an output class uh, to an existing data element and then create a style associated with that in our PDF, right? We shouldn't have to hire a developer or spend money and a lot of effort and time to make that happen, right? We have a lot to do as technical uh, communicators. There's a lot on our plates, right? We don't have time to go ahead and learn how to do all of these things ourselves or go out and source uh, a consultant to do the work for us, right? Uh, all of those sorts of things um, should be ideally self-service, right? Using your, uh, your existing kind of skill set and, uh, and expertise that you have in-house and be able to really, in an agile way, update the look and feel of our PDF documents um, in more or less real time, right? We shouldn't, have to, we shouldn't have to have separate templates for adding watermarks or have parameters that we need to remember the syntax for to pass to the, uh, the publishing job to add simple things like a watermark, right? Uh, all of this stuff is really common, um, common requirements for, uh, for many, and I would dare to say all uh, technical documentation team, particularly those uh, who uh, who still have that hard requirement to generate a PDF that meets all of their branding guidelines um, and also um, and also is easy to uh, to maintain and customize going forward. And sort of one more thing about that, right? I talked about um, did an open toolkit and those third party formatters, and even though we love it, Framemaker as well, right? All of these options, are pretty heavy. And so um, if I'm generating a long, uh, a long PDF, say 500 pages or so, um, and particularly if that PDF has a lot of large tables in it, uh, those can be very processing intensive. Um, but uh, those are Java-based jobs. We have to spin up a Java virtual machine, run that code within that virtual machine, it's a pretty heavy option. Um, so uh, it increases load on the server our component content management system is running on, impacts potentially performance for other users. And also, by the way, because it's heavy and because we have to spin up those virtual machines and all of those other things, all of these options tend to be a bit slow, right? So uh, when we think about all of uh, the time that we might be spending today waiting for a PDF to render, regardless of how uh, we might be doing that, right? We really want to take some of that friction out of the process and be able to um, generate our PDF and, and move on with our day, rather than you know waiting and waiting and waiting uh, for for that uh, for that document to be generated for us. 
and oh, by, by the way, did I mention all of the coding that would be required in order to actually facilitate any modifications to that template, right? We talked about this already. The idea of swapping out a logo, changing header colors to reflect your new company branding guidelines, whatever the case might be, even something as simple as defining a new font, right? That can be very, very coding intensive um, when we start thinking about um, you know, using um, our free open source option and did an open toolkit and even some of the others in terms of the uh, third party PDF formatters and so forth, right? So to all of this, everything we just talked about, right? To all of this, Adobe says, let there be light. Lightweight PDF design and publishing that is. So one of the things um, that Adobe has been working on lately and is really pleased to be able to reveal here today in the context of our, uh, our annual uh, virtual Ditto World 2022 conference is the native PDF publishing feature that is now available with XML documentation for Adobe Experience Manager. And what we're going to do with this, uh, this new capability of XML documentation is going to be really enable you to do all of the things that a developer used to have to do, right? So we want to provide you with low code and no code options for customizing your PDF all within the browser, right? So we're going to use common web-based languages, common web technologies in order to design and customize our PDF output going forward using this new publishing option available from Adobe. We're going to use HTML. We're going to use CSS, very commonly used web technologies, right? Um, in fact, the backbone of the web. And a lot of organizations have a lot of people who have skills in these areas and can go ahead and contribute their uh, design and expertise uh, to a PDF output um, very simply within the browser. So we want to enable you to really easily customize your cover pages, add your logo, add a custom background image, add all of these things that make up a useful and visually appealing cover page, because that's one of the things that was absolutely missing from that, uh, from that Ditto Open Toolkit PDF that we saw earlier, right? It wasn't colorful, it was black and white. Here we can really easily add a splash of color here, a logo there, you can see a watermark, all of the metadata that we have also uh, present on the cover page here. Um, we can do that with a few clicks within the browser rather than going into the XSLFO um, and ultimately uh, testing that code out in a fairly heavy manner, right? So we want to design custom page layouts, add those watermarks really easily as just a toggle to turn on when I'm publishing, right? Is this a draft version? Let's, let's turn on that watermark and we'll go, go ahead and, and just publish it and move on with our day, right? We don't need to have multiple transformation types to facilitate that. We don't need to have parameters that we can't remember the syntax for to pass to our publishing engine in order to get um, a seemingly simple thing like a watermark, right? And we want to enable you to do all of this from the browser. Right, so you can see here, and we'll take a hands-on look here in a moment at how we can actually facilitate all of this directly from the authoring environment provided by XML documentation for Adobe Experience Manager. Right, so we're going to have page layouts that we can modify um, as we see fit. We're going to have style sheets that define the way notes look and bullets look and uh, all of those things. Right, we're going to have this no code option of doing it all uh, with the options you see on the right hand side of this screenshot and certainly uh, also more powerful capabilities to work within the source view of, of the html work natively in the css if we're a little bit more advanced with our capabilities there um, and ultimately be able to design a beautiful very nicely branded easy to customize pdf document all from within your browser, all from within the environment 
you would be using to actually author the content itself. And so with all of that, it is now time for our demo. So let's go ahead and take a look at this new publishing option that we can provide as part of XML documentation for Adobe Experience Manager. So as I mentioned, right, all of this work can be done from within our authoring environment that we call XML Editor. Um, this is a web-based tool, if you haven't seen it or worked with it before, um, that really is, as we move forward, becoming more and more of an integrated development environment, or IDE, for your structured DITA XML content. Right? So we've got our cryptozoological field guide uh, up on the screen, and this is our authoring environment. Right? So I can go ahead and you know, make changes here. Uh, we can add content. This is this is where we can do our authoring and ultimately content management, version control, things like that. And so we can go ahead and check that in, and we have now a new version of the content. So um, all of this is really just to show you um, that we have an authoring environment to which we have added a PDF design and publishing environment as well. So uh, looking to bring everything within a single unified interface so that you don't have to use a wide range of tools to accomplish the goals that you have in terms of uh, publishing, authoring, managing content, or any of those other things that we need to do uh, in the context of a CCMS. Right. So uh, this is the document we'll be looking to publish. This is our, again, our cryptozoological field guide. And let's take a look at some of the options we have uh, for, uh, for customizing our out-of-the-box template that we provide. And that's all going to happen here uh, under our output tab. So if I click there, I'm going to be brought to um, you know, sort of an a order and hierarchy here of our page layouts. Um, you know, different style sheets that might come into play. I've got resources that I've added in terms of, uh, you know, different logos or icons that I might want to use within my output, right? So we're just going to walk through this and explore a little bit about what a preset looks like, how to change and design things like our front cover, work with the CSS to style various data elements and so forth. Right. So when I open up my preset, I'm going to see you know, a number of options. Right? We can choose um, the file name that we want to use. We can apply, of course, conditions using either a DITAVAL or what we call in our solution a condition preset. We can use baselines for um, managing different releases of a document that correspond with product releases and so forth. Right? Under the Layout tab, I'm going to have the ability to define a specific template that I want to use. Um, and out of the box, we provide uh, one called basic, uh, which we're not going to look at too much today, and one called advanced that's going to have more page layouts available and, and a little bit more control and, uh, and options in terms of what we want to do there. We can also very easily set up security for our published PDF document. So I can set a password or restrict the document in certain ways, right? We can uh, change the password. We can allow people to print or not, um, copying or not, etc. right? So there's a lot of options that we can set here. And then under the advanced tabs, uh, we can do things to uh, enhance accessibility, uh, which is uh, what we call a tag PDF, um, embed fonts so that the, uh, the reader does not need them available on their system if we're using our own custom fonts that we don't want to license for everybody, right? We can do some very sophisticated uh, manipulation of the content using JavaScript. Uh, we're not going to delve into that much today. And we can do things like compression, uh, watermarking, which will um, actually let's set that up now since we're here. Um, I'm just going to add my draft watermark in. Um, and then we can also set the PDF to comply with various, uh, various standards that might exist. So uh, standard PDF, PDF A, and so forth. Right, so those are some of the options we get when we think about the preset itself. And um, as part of the preset, 
when we went and defined that PDF template that we used, right? If I go back here, I can see I do have access to my advanced and basic, and you can make as many of these as you like, um, but we just have two to work with today. And if I delve into them, we'll see that I do have layouts for various types of pages, including front and back cover, chapter, uh, chapter cover pages, uh, first left and right versions of those, if I want to apply that there, um, a common page, which is going to be just kind of a standard page. And, the, and then, of course, things like um, front matter pages, glossary, index, uh, other things like that table of contents, landscape layouts, and so forth. Right. So if I want to take a look at um, and we had a little preview of this previously um, when I showed you the screenshots of the PDF we'll be publishing today. Um, here's, here's what it looks like to actually work on my cover page, my front, front cover uh, layout for this document, right? And what we can do is really easily insert uh, fields, um, think about them as variables, and those can be tied to um, uh, information that exists within uh, your uh, your data maps or your book maps. In this case, we're publishing a book map. So let's add a new field to our cover page. You can see I've already applied a background image and my logo. Um, let's add a field, and I can do that right from here. And then I can choose, so do I want a date, a specific time, um, anything, you know, if I want to have my page count, chapter titles, and those would usually show up in things like page headings and, and things like their headers rather and things like that. Um, but I can also choose to define um, metadata. And this is going to use an XPath expression um, that is then going to pull the information from your book map, in this case, and inject it onto the page. So um, I might want to use, and I've created already, this short description one. I can have my copyright information, publisher, really any information that exists within that map. I can, as long as I can uh, write an XPath expression for it, insert it onto my cover page with just a few clicks, or into my header or footer, onto my back cover, whatever the case may be. Right. So in my case, I'm just going to go ahead and insert my short description there. And you can see it came through in this kind of uh, wildly large font. So let's go ahead and adjust that. And this is where um, a lot of the power of this comes in, right? If I wanted to adjust the size of a font in Ditto Open Toolkit, and then I've got to dig into my style sheets and, and go ahead and, and try that out, um, do some coding. Um, in our case, right, I just want to set a font size. So let's use our uh, sans serif font just uh, as a as a default. Uh, let's leave it as standard weight. And then let's give it a size. So I'm just going to go look how tiny it got. So I can kind of size that up as we go. So maybe my short description should be a little bit smaller than my title here. And let's also give it a font color. So let's make that a beautiful shade of green. I don't know how well that will go with our overall design here. Um, but you can see I can choose really any color that I need, um, either by clicking in uh, in the areas here, defining the numbers manually, and I can choose you know, different methods of defining those colors as well. Right, So pretty easy to go ahead with. Uh, no coding yet. Right? You can see it's this kind of vibrant shade of green, um, and we defined you know, the font size, the color uh, we inserted, the reference to that document property that's embedded in the prologue of our uh, of our book map. So that's just sort of an example of some of the things that you can do in terms of laying out with no code at all, right? Aside from you know, knowing the XPath expression, which isn't too bad. Now I can also, if I want to, because this is all based just on HTML and CSS, right? I can also go into the source mode and work with the HTML directly. So if I want to code in um, some things you know, that, that are not possible through, uh, through the UI, right? If you want to get very sophisticated with uh, rounded edges around your, 
uh, borders of things or whatever the case might be, uh, we can go ahead and apply that CSS here, um, either by directly embedding the styles within the HTML itself, uh, or we can also uh, do that by reference, of course, uh, using an external CSS. So we've got access to the code. We don't have to touch it if we don't want to, um, but all of those options are available and it uh, can become quite powerful quite quickly. So let's go ahead and save that. And then another thing I want to show you is the ability to um, manage the CSS here much in the same way, right? Just like we, uh, just like we worked with before, uh, we do have the ability to choose various font families, etc. Now for these, uh, these are actually note styles that I've got configured here. So you can see what my note would look like. And I've got an icon that I've defined for that. And much the same way I've done that for the other data note types that are available here as well. Right, so my fast path has a, a nice little rabbit icon. Uh, my notice is going to have an exclamation point, and uh, and so on. Right, uh, so quite a bit of of uh, powerful capability here when we think about how we want to de design um, various elements that are going to appear in that PDF output. And maybe I've decided. Um, I think we had a warning in our uh, our topic on the Yeti that we looked at briefly earlier. Um, and so maybe I decide orange is not the right color for me, right? So I can open up my background options here, right? And I can um, you know, obviously define things like image, path, Im image paths. Um, you know, I want to have perhaps a border, um, other things like pagination. I can have a break after. So if you really want to have uh, some control over uh, over page breaks. Um, you know, we have some options to handle that here within the CSS um, and also you know, obviously uh, within the UI, right? I don't have to code any CSS to do these things. But let's just, you know, as, a, as an option here, uh, go ahead and choose a new, new background color for, uh, for our warning note type. And let's make that this kind of blue color with that uh, I've also defined, of course, uh, this border here on the left. So I've got this left border uh, that's going to be orange, right? So I could have modified that as well. You know, maybe I want to have a top border here um, as well, or anything of that nature is uh, certainly certainly possible. So we have a solid border. Um, now I've got a top and a right, um, and then we can maybe go all the way around it if we really want to call attention to that. So no coding required, um, just selecting options here from within our UI. Right. Likewise, I can do the same thing for other types of uh, other types of elements that might appear. Right. So I might have a heading uh, style, um, and we might want to define those um, here as well. So if I've got a chapter heading, I might want that to jump over to the right side of the page with this uh, nice border, um, or you know perhaps. Maybe I find this font to be a bit wa or large, and uh, maybe I want to uh, shrink that down a little bit. Let's make that 28 instead. Uh, that gives us uh, a uh, unwrapped uh, bit of text there as our chapter heading. Uh, so I can also, much like I did with the CSS, I can go in here and ultimately take a look at the source. Um, I can see that my H1 h2 and so forth are all defined here um, and we can go ahead and either use the ui to go ahead and, and define the uh, the styles here you can see those note styles that i was working with before um, i can uh, choose you know set up a background image for them uh, that's where those icons were coming from etc and really easily modify those things using again, common web technologies like HTML and CSS, as opposed to the more esoteric options that, uh, that are available from uh, the Open Toolkit, right? Digging into all of that code, uh, learning new, thing, new skills that um, aren't going to have a lot of value outside of uh, modifying that PDF. So uh, we do have this blue theme here, um, but we also took a look at you know, we have a simple theme, right? So let's publish a simple PDF first, and let's call this uh, simple theme 
yeah, let's just leave it like that. Simple theme and crypto is just the name of my map. Again, I have the same options available here. I could choose where I want to publish it to. Um, if there's a specific location in my dam where that needs to go in order to uh, in order to be surfaced on a given page, etc., we can choose the output path for this. Uh, again, apply those conditions, define file names. I'm going to use my basic layout for this particular simple theme PDF. Um, and we have the same options in terms of security and you know, some of these advanced things. We're not going to use a watermark for this one. Uh, so let's go ahead and publish that and see what it looks like. This is going to be our simple theme. Not going to have that nice cover page that we were looking at just a moment ago. Uh, it's just going to be fairly straightforward and a really um, you know, lightly designed starting point for you. Uh, to come in and use some of the tools we just looked at in order to customize the look and feel of your PDF output. So let's download that. And you can see, um, actually, it doesn't look that different from some of those screenshots I showed of the Ditto Open Toolkit before as a starting point. Right, So we can see uh, we've got our aquatic cryptids top or, uh, chapter here, rather, um, which includes things like Champ and, of course, the Kraken. Um, and other lake monsters, et cetera. Um, and then all of our land cryptids are in chapter two. So you get a nice, very simple uh, PDF out of the box, right? And then we can go ahead and customize that um, using the tools we were just looking at. So that's the basic option. It's uh, a good starting point, but there's certainly nothing super exciting about that out of the box, other than it was fast. You might have noticed how quickly that happened. Um, nothing up my sleeve here. I didn't pause the recording or anything while that happened. So it's nice and fast. Uh, we're going to generate these PDFs in um, a fraction of the time you may be accustomed to using those heavier uh, PDF rendering options that we discussed a little bit earlier. So let's close out of our simple theme. And then with our blue theme, recall, we did set that watermark, right? We changed the look and feel of that warning, which is present here, right? Uh, about approaching the wild Yeti. Shouldn't do that. They're very dangerous if you can find one. Um, so we changed the look and feel of that. It's no longer to be this kind of, uh, I don't know, orangish background. Um, it's now going to be that blue background we selected before. And I can toggle between authoring and output here, um, all within the same environment. So I don't need to jump to any additional tools to go ahead and design and, and publish my PDF. So let's go ahead and generate that blue theme PDF that we've been working on together here over the past 15 minutes or so. And I'm just going to go ahead and click again. And that's going to generate. Notice how quickly it's going. And I'm talking the whole time. So again, nothing up my sleeve. Uh, there are no uh, smoke and mirrors involved here. Um, we generated that PDF very quickly. Of course, this is a smallish one. Uh, larger ones might take a little bit longer. But it should be, again, significantly more performant than some of the options you might be aware of today. Uh, so I'm just going to open up my PDF again. And let's download that, and we'll see what that looks like. So again, we have our cryptozoology field guide. We've got our nice background image here with this sort of blue whoosh of color. Um, the Adobe logo, uh, obviously our title on the cover page is an important aspect of that. Um, there's our watermark. You can see the, uh, the green kind of uh, subtitle here the Adobe Ditto World 2022 edition of the Cryptozoology Field Guide, which is, I'm sad to say, not all that different from any previous versions that any of you who have seen some of my other presentations might have seen. Um, but we can get this really nice result without doing a lot of custom coding. So there's our nice, um, uh, our nice kind of chapter page with the uh, right justified uh, title here for our chapter, and then a little more white space between lines that we saw in that uh, simpler uh, or basic PDF option. Um, and then uh, we can go ahead and scroll through and learn again about our friend Champ and perhaps some of the other monsters that may exist in your neck of the woods. So the Chupacabra, the Sasquatch, etc. 
Um, not included in this guide is the Hodeg, which is native to my home state, the state of Wisconsin, up in the Rhinelander area, which is about in the middle of the state. Uh, we'll have to get that added pretty soon. Um, and there is, of course, our uh, our warning that we customized together as well with the uh, kind of obnoxious orange box around it and the, the blue background. So um, I'm not expecting a lot of you to reach out to me to help design your PDFs. Um, design is not really my thing, um, but I can uh, go ahead and make, make certain that it would be very ugly if you chose uh, to choose uh, to work with me to, to do that. I've got the nice orange and blue contrast there, which is uh, probably hurting your eyeballs at the moment. So that's really um, the end of the, the demo I wanted to do. Um, we're really excited to unleash this feature on the world and really empower uh, all of our customers to start creating their own custom PDF layouts, create those new looks and feels, swap out that logo, add that watermark just with a couple of clicks, um, really taking a lot of the friction out of the process of customizing those PDFs that we still need to deliver in a lot of cases to our customers, right? Or at least we want to be able to provide that as an option. So I really do want to thank you um, not only for attending my session today, uh, but also for attending a lot of the other wonderful sessions that I know we have planned um, for you to uh, enjoy as part of Ditto World 2022. Um, any questions that you may have, um, again, please do uh, feel free to pop those into the chat. Uh, I'll be online during the, uh, during the session. Um, and so we'd be happy to uh, answer any questions you may have. Um, and then if you do want to reach out to us, um, you can find me at dibdoll at adobe.com and also techcom at adobe.com. We'd love to have a conversation with you around your PDF and other types of needs that you may have with regards to your documentation. Have a great day. I've been Chad. Enjoy the rest of the conference, everyone, and thank you very much. Hello and welcome to this session today at Adobe Ditto World with the title Content Optimization with Concrete in Adobe AEM. And before we start, um, some information about myself. My name is Michael Mannhardt and at Concrete I run the international business activities. I also sign as president of our US subsidiary and I'm dealing with international partners, for instance, like Adobe. So when we are getting asked to describe what we do with Concre, the best way to describe Concre is to say we help companies to create better content. And how we do that? We do that with our software platform, which is the Concre authoring server. And with that, we provide feedback to content creators about content quality, right? Where they write content, for instance, in editing environments like Adobe um, FrameMaker, Adobe InDesign, or in Adobe AEM. And all this is supported by what we call linguistic intelligence. So what we do, we incorporate, for instance, style guides from companies and also company-specific terminology. And we also provide existing content for reuse within the actual content creation process. And we provide also help for content optimization to the authors during the content creation process. Some information about Concrete as a company. Concrete had been founded 12 years ago in the year 2010, but the history of our technology goes a bit back. Um, we have a background from a German science research institute and at this institute already 30 years ago, the basic development of our core technology had been developed to support companies 
with a software platform that supports writers, authors to create better content and to optimize content. And the first customers had been in the German automotive sector. And following that, we had a very nice growth story over the years in the German speaking countries. And so 2020, it was the start also to go towards international markets. And so we started um, mainly um, in the US and Canadian market, which also had been quite successful since that. Today, we have around 220 corporate customers with very well-known names. Let's take a look at some of them. I mentioned um, automotive customers. We have various of the German car manufacturers, like for instance, Daimler and BMW. But besides the automotive industry, we have customers in lots of different verticals, quite a few manufacturing and engineering customers. As you can see, uh, um, there are very different companies in, in very uh, different verticals with a different range of products. And some examples out of the automotive industry, for instance, are um, VMware, Juniper Networks, Hologic, Bosch, Schindler Elevators, Miele, MTU, Siemens, and many, many more. So I think it's a fair question to ask what makes all these companies with a very different background to work with Concre? What are the typical pain points all these companies have? What do they share? What is their challenge? And I think one thing we can say is they all look for content quality. No question about that. But where does actually content quality start? What is, what is an essential thing of content quality? It's definitely consistency. Consistency is a very important part of structured documentation. We are here at Adobe Data World, so most of the attendees probably do structured documentation or at least think about structured documentation. You look for the same structure, for the same information types, you look for topic-based creation and so on. You all know, you all know how topic-oriented documentation with Ditter works. Authors create topics, topics end up in a knowledge base. At any time, topics are aggregated into a document on the basis of the metadata. And the final result is well-formed XML, topics have been reused, and all data criteria have been fulfilled. On the surface, everything looks good. But don't look at topics as a black box that can be combined in any way. It's also important to take the linguistic aspects into account, for instance, like consistency, coherence, and so on. Because consistent documents, consistent topics are great, but looking under the surface could mean to find out that not necessarily you will find the language itself actually being consistent. And that includes terminology, of course. So let's take a look at language and how language is understandable and how it works has a lot to do with who creates this language. And probably you know this 80s TV series characters, or maybe some of them are from the 90s. So let's imagine these guys work in a content creation team, in your content creation team, and let's assign roles to them. If you know them, you certainly agree that they are completely different characters with very different personalities. You have a bit of a nerdy guy like Shelton Cooper who always tries to explain things in a very detailed way. We have the very pragmatic MacGyver is not spending too many words to explain things. He rather has a pragmatic focus on the actual results. We have Dr. House, very academic, however, with a bit of a probably cynical and ironical tonality. So try to imagine these guys are part of your content creation team. They all have different roles in your team, but they all contribute to your content creation. Of course, the content these gentlemen will create 
sounds different, even if they write about one and the same thing on the sentence level, one and the same thing, for instance, described by Shelton Cooper will be very much described in detail. But if we take a look at MacGyver, he will not waste too many words. Probably he will straight get to the point of what needs to be said. And the same we have on the word level, different terminology will be used. And by that, all the different wording goes into your publication channels. In times of single source publishing, this inconsistency goes to your uh, CMS from there into various publications all over your content. Not very good, probably. And this is a reason why many of the companies we work with have similar challenges, because it all starts with the um, content creation teams and um, how different the content creators are. And, and many companies and organizations that use our technology have challenges because of that with consistency, understandability and comprehensibility. And since they have lots of content creators and it's difficult for them to make all of these content creators write with one company specific language, um, they have a big challenge, but they have to make sure that their content will be understood and received by their content target groups. But very often, Typical pain points are very often the same in, in many organizations. It's simply difficult to enforce a corporate language. You have subject matter experts are great in uh, what they do, but not necessarily in writing. So the content they write um, not always sounds perfect. And in addition, uh, um, many companies we work with have problems with exploding translation costs due to um, missing consistency because the more content you have, the more ha you have to translate. And of course, there are uh, um, activities to avoid all of this uh, by having a high volume of review. And yeah, of course, manual review also costs a lot of time and also includes a lot of costs. So. What can be a help? Maybe a corporate style guide. Certainly, good start. Also, corporate terminology to define that could be a great start. It's definitely something which is on the right way. But how can you make sure if you have a style guide or if you have several style guides, and if you have corporate terminology, which had been defined, how can you make sure that all content creators know how to apply this style guide in their daily work? How can they remember all the single rules that had been defined for style and grammar? And how can they make sure that they remember all the different terms that had been defined for allowed terminology and for deprecated terminology. How can all the content creators, which are in a team, which is probably spread all over the globe, write on the same basis and how this is, how is this something that can be enforced in daily content creation work? Maybe not much of a surprise, technology can help here, like the concrete authoring server. So let's take a look what the concrete authoring server actually is and what is behind. The concrete authoring server works on a client server basis with three main components on the server side. And let's unlock what is behind the question marks here. So the first dimension we like to talk about is language check. And this checks for style and grammar to achieve a company-wide consistent style and grammar. And it means that already existing style guides can be taken over and brought into what we call a linguistic rule set. And then the, on this basis, content will be checked and content creators will receive a feedback if a style or a grammar rule had been violated. And if there is 
content which they created which is not aligned with their organization's style and grammar rules. So the second dimension I like to talk about is terminology that allows to def define company specific terminology which is understood by your customers, users and target groups. Also the right branding, the right usage of brand names, product names, etc. can be included. And also here, many companies already have something very often. And the challenge is how to bring that into the content creation process. And this is also what content optimization technology does. Content optimization technology provides feedback to writers, to content creators, if, for instance, a wrong term had been used or wrong product name. So writers will see if there is something wrong and then they have the chance to correct an error and to make sure that content they write is aligned with their company's branding guidelines and their company specific terminology. So how does this get now into the actual content creation? And as I mentioned, Concrete is a client server architecture and we connect with various systems in the content creation and language technology landscape. And a very important part of our connectivity certainly is the connectivity on the client side by having a connectivity into various content creation environments, which means the environments where authors write content, like for instance, the Adobe product family, like um, Adobe InDesign or Adobe FrameMaker. And we're quite proud since recently, we now also have an integration into Adobe Experience Manager guides and during the following uh, minutes i like to guide you a bit through this integration and show you how you can check content and how you can optimize content within adobe um, experience manager guides wait a second please so let me explain how the concrete integration into aem works and by clicking on a sentence in real time, the sentence will be checked immediately and then you will see notifications in the sentence if a sentence is not corresponding with any of the defined style or grammar rules or like here where in the sentence, for instance, wrong terminology had been used. And by clicking on one of the notifications, you will see more details and there are also proposals to replace, for instance, a wrong term um, like in this case. So in this case, um, there is a deprecated term, which is defined as a term that is not allowed to be used. And there is a preferred term, which is the term that is defined to be used. And by clicking on the proposal, the forbidden term will be replaced by the preferred term. And if there are, by the way, um, any notifications you don't want to see, like in this example, informations about terms that are already known, which is something that not really helps the author. I mean, this is already um, fine. And if you like to focus on um, the pieces of information, the notifications that really help you to optimize the content, you can skip that and define that only um, the notifications will be shown um, that are relevant for you and that unwanted notifications are not going to be shown. Okay, let's go to another one here. And that is another terminology um, notification. And as we can see here, there is a term that is admitted and that is the term device. And Admitted, that means it can be used in a certain context, but there is actually another term that is defined as the preferred term. This is instrument. That's the term that um, should be used, that is prefer preferred. And that is the term we can now insert by clicking on it, and then it will be um, corrected if we want that. Okay, 
In addition to the notifications within the sentences, which we just had now, um, you also have the info box on the right side of the screen. And this shows the notifications as well. And you can use the info box to navigate through the notifications. And instead of checking a particular sentence by clicking on it, you can also check the entire document with a click if you want. So let's go to another notification. And so wait a second. We go to that one here, safety informations, which we can see here. So, and if we click on that, we can see there is a notification to review this sentence. Um, and concrete informs me, informs me to review the noun phrase and it says correct the noun to singular so if i correct that the content will be um, rechecked and then it disappears and now this sentence is fine by the way you can completely configure where the concrete info box appears um, could be on the right side could be on the left side you can also define for what the notifications will be shown for instance for errors on the current page if you want that and then i will see all errors on the current page within the info box and i can scroll down um, the notifications and if i click on a specific notification my content also then will move to exactly the place where this um, notification um, is relevant where this error um, occurs. So let's make an example here. Okay, and now we are exactly at the location of this error. Okay, if I enable, by the way, terminology research, I will also get um, a lot of additional information about each term um, that um, for instance, can give me um, a definition of each term. With, I can see more information on each term. Um, a lot of information that helps the authors to understand what the term is about, in what context it should be used. Uh, I can see synonyms and linked terms. So um, as an author, I see a lot of additional information um, which make will make me understand um, what this term is about. Okay, another important question is, how is this terminology actually getting created? Of course, I can import um, existing terminology from already existing terminology sources as TBX or as a CSV from an Excel sheet. But also during the content creation process, new terminology gets created. And so Concre scans the content for new terminology and makes proposals if there are so-called term candidates. And if the authors feel this term indeed should be um, in the term database, then they can propose this term candidates. And whoever was the head of terminology management within uh, your organization finally can approve this term and add it to the terminology database. And once this is approved, then this is something which is available for the complete user um, uh, community and all authors can benefit from this additional term. So this is what I wanted to show in brief about um, the checking with Concre within Adobe AEM um, for style, grammar, and terminology. Let's move to another very interesting um, thing which we can do. But before that, a bit theory first. So we now saw the AEM integration. Um, hope you liked it. Uh, but probably you remember this slide, which we saw before. And there was one 
hidden area still with a question mark and I like also to unlock this and to show you what is behind this one here. And this is what now makes content optimization complete. Um, to recap, we have two dimensions. We have language check, we have uh, language check for checking style and grammar, and we have terminology that checks for company specific terminology and, and branding. And we optimize content, we help content creators to optimize their content. Um, but there also is something which adds much more to content optimization, and that is if I already have optimized quality checked content, proven content, that's great. But what could make the picture now complete? What could be consequent now? And that is to reuse already quality checked content, to bring that back into the content um, creation process. And that's the third component, which we have in the Conquery authoring server. And this is what we call authoring memory or also known as reuse. This provides already existing content for reuse on a sentence basis. And this is not only a great help for authors, um, they can type in a few keywords and then they get suggestions of uh, complete already existing quality checked sentences. There also is a huge impact on several other aspects. And as we know, an important idea in DITA is um, reuse and there are some levels of reuse in DITA. First, there is structural reuse, for instance, DITA maps and, and uh, maps. Second level is topic reuse and take a topic and use it somewhere else. That's the idea of topic reuse. Um, and, and what does a topic consist of? Topics consist at least of sentences but most likely of various different sentences. Most likely topics are not created by one and the same person. Most likely you have various writers, subject matter experts, developers, and so on that contribute to the number of topics which you have. So if on a sentence level within your topics, one and the same thing will be expressed in different ways that won't help your audience to understand and uh, to reach a better comprehensibility. But if you achieve consistency on a sentence level, that of course will help a lot in various aspects. And if now content on a sentence level that already had been used in a topic later will be reused to create content, content that will be used in another topic, that will help a lot to achieve consistency. So, so, okay, that's what now makes content optimization complete. Let's recap. We have language check for checking style and grammar. We have terminology and we have reuse. And so let's take a look at that into FrameMaker and let's take another few minutes to show you what authoring memory can do. Wait a second, please. So let's take a look into the authoring memory component. If you activated that by clicking on a sentence, you will search for similar sentences and you will see similar sentences um, with a calculation of their similarity. So to take over a sentence, just click on it and it will replace the former sentence. And like with the notifications um, we had for style and grammar, you can either click on a sentence and get suggestions, but you can also check the entire content for authoring memory suggestions. And then um, if this is done, you can navigate through the sentences to evaluate what could be a fit. So this will happen in a moment. We'll uh, gets the suggestions for the entire piece of content. Now it's there. Now we can navigate through the sentences. So since Conqueri works in real time, typing sentences will immediately provide suggestions for similar sentences out of the authoring memory repository. And possibly 
newly written sentences may have no matches yet. So, however, might be worse to add them to the sentence database. And we can do that um, by the so-called authoring memory candidates. But it can be that Concre will not allow that because the quality is not good enough um, to meet the quality requirements. And so Concre um, only provides sentences that have a sufficient quality. If this is the case, the sentence can be proposed. And if it's getting approved, then it will be added to the authoring memory database and will be available for all users. So that's what I wanted to show very much in brief about the concrete authoring memory functionality, a very useful function. So far, so good about content optimization in Adobe AEM in the Adobe Experience Manager guides with Concre and the Concre authoring server. I hope you liked what you saw. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask your questions now. We are still here for a few minutes. Um, I um, like to thank you for joining this session. Also a big thanks to the entire Adobe team for the chance and honor to participate Adobe Ditter World and to have this presentation it was a big pleasure. If you have any questions in the future, of course, you can also send me an email. Please send an email to mmanhart at concrete.com. And of course, you're also welcome to visit our website, concrete.com. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of the day and hope to see you soon. Take care. Thank you. Hello everyone, and thanks for joining us today. I'm Kalika Gerg, Group Product Manager with Adobe Stickcom Group. Today we'll see how XML documentation for Adobe Experience Manager brings the power of Adobe Analytics to your content. So you can gather data into the content consumption patterns and use those insights to define your content strategy. Let me start by giving a brief overview of Adobe Analytics. Adobe Analytics is a market leader in consumer analytics. It is Adobe's cloud-based offering for usage tracking and reporting. Adobe Analytics tracks the usage and consumption of your end users as and when they're consuming the content posted on your public sites. Then Adobe Analytics generates various user-friendly reports, which gives you insights into these consumption patterns. One of the very important capability of Adobe Analytics is a highly intuitive graphical user interface for delivering reports. This makes it easier for stakeholders such as content managers to focus on what is relevant, that is usage reports. With XML documentation for AEM, we bring the power of Adobe Analytics to your content. With XML documentation, we provide out-of-box template for publishing your content, and we call it the knowledge base template. This knowledge base template is instrumented to track the usage using Adobe Analytics. So when you publish your content or articles to this knowledge base template, you get the full power of Adobe Analytics by default for your published content. And what do we mean by full power of Adobe Analytics? What we mean is that the default tracking and instrumentation in the template generates actionable insights for content authors and managers. But what are these actionable insights? For one, you get various usage and consumption pattern reports. These give you deep quantitative insights at two levels, your customers and your content. 
At consumer level, these reports tell you who your users are, where they are, and how they are consuming the content. At content level, you can see which is your most popular content, which content gets viewed together, what is the most frequently searched content, and so on. Adobe Analytics also provides anomaly detection, which can provide content oversight. Anomaly detection provides a statistical method to determine how a given metric has changed in relation to previous data. It lets you identify which statistical fluctuation matter and which don't. You can then identify the root cause of a true anomaly and take corrective action. Example of anomalies you might want to investigate include spikes in content views from a particular geo, or spikes in support or troubleshooting page for a specific part or a product, or let's say drops in landing page views. And then the third one, the Adobe Analytics generate insights for you, which can inform your content strategy. For example, you can see the queries for which your end users are not able to find answers or which content has lower rating from end users. This allows you to determine where to direct your investment from content authoring perspective. So these three together form the actionable insights for content authors and managers. So actionable insights enable authors and content managers to do more with their content. But in addition to enabling the authors and managers, external documentation has built-in automation to put these analytics to work for you. This automation brings the power of analytics to your end users in the form of dynamic experiences. The out-of-box knowledge-based template provided by XML documentation has dynamic widgets available in the template. These dynamic widgets have a reverse integration with Adobe Analytics. So they pull aggregate data from Adobe Analytics to generate dynamic content for your end users. For example, traditionally, authors might be documenting the top few documentation topics at the landing page. But with these dynamic content widgets, authors do not have to do that anymore. The dynamic widgets pull this information from Adobe Analytics directly. So your end users get an up-to-date list of frequently viewed topics, which is based on data captured by Adobe Analytics. And as your end users browse different content, this data keeps getting updated, and your end users always get real-time dynamic content from these widgets. So think of all the manual work which authors would have to do to pull this information about most frequently viewed topics from analytics manually and then document it, document it in the landing page and then publish the landing page. And the list of frequently viewed topics would change and authors would have to keep doing this task repeatedly. But these dynamic widgets remove all that manual work and saves valuable time for authors. So we have heard about a lot of exciting stuff about how XML documentation brings more power to your team and to your content with Adobe Analytics. And now it is time to see all of this in action in a demo. So let us start by looking at the content which has been published to AEM using XML documentation. Uh, these are some of the articles or topics that uh, we have published using the new knowledge base template, which is instrumented for tracking by Adobe Analytics. And uh, we have put together this whole uh, guide, uh, which is the product documentation guide for Overhub. And uh, as uh, users are browsing or uh, through this content, all that uh, data is being tracked in Adobe Analytics. So let's go to the Adobe Analytics uh, dashboard. Let's me start by logging into uh, Adobe's DX Cloud. So this is the landing page for Adobe's uh, DX Cloud, and you can access various uh, DX solutions from here. We are interested in 
accessing analytics where we are tracking this analytics data. Logging in there will take me to my workspaces. Uh, I have multiple workspaces. The one where I'm tracking the data from this particular uh, guide or content that has been published to AEM is, uh, I, I'm calling it RHKB reports. And uh, we can, uh, now we'll look at each uh, individual report and what are the capabilities available there. One of the reports here is the top search terms. So it uh, gives you which are the top user queries. This is uh, tracking the searches users are making either at the KB level or the category level. And uh, then another uh, report is the unanswered search query. So this uh, tracks uh, the search queries for which users were not able to find any articles or any content. Uh, it's a very useful report so uh, to give you insights into what kind of content user is looking for, but uh, you don't have content uh, available for that. So it can help you define uh, your content strategy and which content you should be creating more uh, in your KVs. Then uh, another useful report is the top viewed pages. So it shows which are the pages which are being uh, viewed most by your end users. So which content is being consumed the most. So this is again a good insight for you to know which are the areas in which uh, your end users are seeking help. And uh, another report we have is the geo distribution of visitors. So uh, uh, this uh, helps you determine uh, how your users are uh, distributed uh, geo wise. Uh, it can be a good insight uh, in determining uh, things like how do you want to spend your localization dollars if you are localizing your knowledge base in multiple languages and uh, uh, you can track this at uh, various metric level. Right now, it is tracking unique visitors, due uh, distribution of unique visitors. Uh, but you can also, within those unique visitors, they could be generating different kind of, uh, different number of uh, uh, visits. Uh, so we, you can change that and uh, view that. So maybe some of your power users in, uh, could reside elsewhere. So even though the number of unique visitors are less, but uh, overall they are generating a large number of page views or consuming your uh, um, KB or content more from that geo. Then uh, another useful report is the weekly usage pattern. It tries to uh, analyze the usage in, in uh, and consolidate and aggregate that in a weekly fashion. It's a very useful report if uh, you want to plan major upgrades around your KB or major content uploads or a template update or any other kind of uh, IT update. So this helps you determine uh, the usage patterns and the down days uh, on which around which you can plan your upgrades. Another uh, very interesting and unique report, uh, which is uh, not available uh, easily in uh, a standard tracking system is the knowledge flow report. So what this report does is it tracks the flow of a user within this uh, knowledge base and how they are navigating this content and what's their entry view, uh, page and from there, uh, which is the page where they view next. And so what is their whole uh, navigation? And then how do they exit? Uh, it, it's, it's a good insight into how your users are consuming content. Most of the time, the content consumption paths, uh, whether it's manifesting in terms of breadcrumbs or TOC or uh, trainings or related articles, it's defined by authors. But uh, this report gives you visibility in uh, how uh, end users are viewing it. So it can help you uh, auto create uh, some related content or if you are planning to create some uh, custom courses, putting together a number of related content where uh, end users are seeking help. So it gives you good insights into that particular flow from an end user perspective. Uh, another uh, useful report is uh, the usage pattern in terms of average time spent. And uh, you can see uh, what kind of time your end users are spending on your content. And uh, it helps you also determine whether they are making uh, early exits or they are not spending enough time and what kind of content you should be creating to cater to those particular needs. Then there are some standard reports on uh, which are the browsers used by your uh, users, which are the operating systems used, and uh, the overall uh, 
consumption, the number of page views that your knowledge base is uh, generating over a timeline. So you can, uh, this is this is a useful view to see if you, uh, to detect anomalies also, and to see if you are expecting any standard pattern. So let's say you did a major, major release, and then you did a documentation release around that release, and you were expecting that spike. So uh, you can correlate uh, the spikes to that. But if you don't see uh, spikes uh, where you were expecting spikes, so maybe you need to do a more a push or a campaign to promote that documentation to make sure uh, people are aware of the new release and the corresponding documentation. So uh, these are some of the reports uh, that are available with this new KB template. And uh, while these reports in themselves are uh, very useful, uh, what you can uh, further do and what uh, this KB does is it takes these reports to power end user dynamic experiences within the template. So how it does that is uh, let me take you back to the uh, the knowledge base that we have published, and if we go back to the uh, the category level knowledge base, so uh, you can see uh, the top viewed pages. It just got populated uh, here. And this is uh, not uh, static content. So this content is actually being fetched based on the top viewed pages report from here. And that is what is uh, powering this list here. So your authors are not uh, statically creating this content, but uh, it's being served based on those analytics. So it's real time and gets refreshed regularly and creates a dynamic experience for your end users. And this is just one example of uh, this dynamic widget. So uh, it, this is just to demonstrate that there is this two-way communication happening with Adobe Analytics uh, from the knowledge base. So while the uh, knowledge base uh, usage uh, is being tracked in analytics, and then that is can be used to power uh, dynamic experiences here. So top viewed pages is one. Then you can similarly uh, have uh, when the user start typing uh, have uh, the most frequently searched terms being pulled from the report of uh, the search report. And uh, there are uh, many other such stuff. You can have a category here based on the uh, user's uh, locale, so based on their geo and uh, the this usage report can be filtered in terms of geo, so you can have a dynamic widget for uh, uh, to show the top content being viewed by other users in your region so that uh, users get more uh, localized content rather than uh, uh, the global top view pages. And uh, depending on their use case, they can consume either one of those. And with that, we come to the end of today's session. It was a pleasure showing this to you, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you for joining.